And while we've certainly made our share of mistakes along the way, and our process and our uh, efforts are evolving, um, the goal remains the same, to bring faster, better broadband to communities all over the country and to inspire other providers to do the same. We're excited about the progress that the broadband ecosystem has made. It's come a long way. We all know it has a long, long way to go. But as we welcome in, as we prepare to welcome in a new administration into office, we have an important opportunity today to figure out how to move forward in a bipartisan basis to meet our shared broadband goals, um, broadband deployment and adoption goals. So th thank you again for coming. Thanks to the folks who've um, organized this event. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Deb Sosha to get us started. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Uh, welcome to Transforming Communities, Broadband Goals for 2017 and Beyond. My name is Deb Sosha. I'm the Executive Director of Next Century Cities. It's a nonpartisan collaborative of more than 150 mayors and community leaders who all are committed to ensuring that everyone has fast, affordable, reliable broadband. And the event has come about through the efforts of three different organizations, and you just heard John talk about each of them. Uh, we all are passionate about supporting and helping local communities meet their broadband goals. Uh, we believe today's speakers will uplift the importance of broadband infrastructure at the local level. And we thank you for joining us here and online. Please note that you can participate by tweeting, and the hashtag is BBGoals. Feel free to share questions, comments, and thoughts. Great. Thank you, Deb. I'm, I'm Bill Wallace, Executive Director of US Ignite. We'd like to thank today our sponsors, Google, Harrison Edwards, Ford, and Internet2 for their support of this very important event. Each of our organizations are committed uh, to working with you, local folks, who believe that broadband internet, internet should be a, a utility available for all and required for the success of everyone who lives in the United States. Um, as a nonprofit, we at US Ignite have been working with many communities here to develop services and applications to take advantage of smart, advanced networks. And we've seen the transformative power of these networks across the, the country to shape and improve services to citizens in transportation, health care, education, uh, clean energy, and public safety. We've also seen the benefits of these networks and applications and services to bring in new jobs, new companies, economic investment, and innovative activities. And that's going to be important to us across administrations going forward. Thank you for the chance to host this event today. John? Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Deb. Uh, I am John Windhausen, Executive Director of the School's Health and Libraries Broadband Coalition, or Shelby Coalition. Um, it's been a great collaboration, I have to say. It's, uh, we wish all of Washington would work the way that we've been, the three of us have been able to work together to put this event together. So it's very, we're very pleased to see everybody here in attendance today. Uh, as you know, the school's Health Libraries Broadband Coalition promotes open, affordable, high-capacity broadband for community anchor institutions. Uh, and our focus is on getting broadband to every single community around the country, uh, to and through the anchor institutions. So this is a great event to see how we can accomplish that goal that works very much in conjunction with Next Century Cities and US Ignite. So we're hoping to spread uh, the promise of broadband to everybody in this country, and we look forward to the really exciting conversations and discussions we're going to have today. So it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Larry Strickling, uh, who is head of NTIA. NTIA is the executive branch agency responsible for advising the president on telecom issues. Um, that's the official statement that really doesn't begin to say exactly to, to capture the true impact that NTIA has had and Larry has had on our country over the last few years. NTIA uh, and Larry Strickling is leading the effort to make 500 megahertz of government spectrum available to the private sector. He administered the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, or BTOP, which connected about 26,000 community anchor institutions to broadband. He had also initiated the Broadband USA program, which provides communities with technical assistance uh, so that they can understand their broadband needs. Um, Assistant Secretary Strickling also co-chaired the Broadband Opportunities Council, a group of over 20 federal government agencies 
that issued a report last year to recommend how to remove the ba regulatory barriers to promote greater broadband investment. Um, Larry has served as NTIA head since June of 2009, which I believe makes you the longest serving NTIA administrator in the history of the agency. But your impact is, goes beyond just longevity. Uh, the, it's incredible the amount of work uh, that you and your team have done to promote broadband across the country. I think we'd be hard pressed to find any federal government official who has done more to impact the growth of broadband in this country than Larry Strickland. So please join me in welcoming Larry to the stage. Well, thank you, John, for those very kind remarks. And I know your organization, Schlub, will continue to uh, <laughs> do well. Yeah, for those of you who may not know, at John's very first conference, I came in and not knowing how he was pronouncing the acronym, referred to it as Schlub, and it's <laughs> stuck ever since. But I um, also want to thank Next Century Cities and Deb, and of course, Bill Wallace and U.S. Ignite for inviting me here today for what I expect will be my uh, last speech about broadband as an NTIA administrator. Um, and while this conference is going to focus on setting goals for broadband for the future and, and hopefully identifying some priorities for the next administration, particularly the possibility of a new infrastructure program. Um, I would like to offer my evaluation today as to what's worked well in the Obama administration to expand broadband access and adoption. Uh, the broadband grant programs that we developed and managed at NTIA, and I also have to recognize, where'd she go? Susan Crawford, who was there at the start at the White House when these programs were being put together. Um, but they provided an important opportunity to invest in the nation's future and spur private investment and economic development. Um, we learned a lot, and we continue to share those learnings with communities around the nation through the Broadband USA program that John mentioned. Now, just to remind everyone, uh, the 2009 Recovery Act provided $4 billion to NTIA to use for grants to increase broadband access and adoption in unserved and underserved areas of the country. And the challenge we faced was substantial, which was how could we invest in new broadband infrastructure in areas of the country where private industry had considered it too risky or expensive to invest? And how could we ensure that those investments would efficiently utilize taxpayer dollars to support long-term sustainable broadband business models? But I will tell you that looking at the results of our efforts, the program we designed successfully met those challenges. Um, as we will be detailing in our new report to be released in the coming weeks, the projects built through these grants are benefiting communities across the country today and will continue to deliver benefits for years to come. Our grant recipients deployed or upgraded more than 117,000 network miles across the country, connected more than 25,000, John had 26,000, so, uh, but it was a lot of community anchor institutions, such as schools, libraries, and hospitals. Um, we invested 3.3 billion of the 4 billion in infrastructure projects, and just to give you a sense of this, today, Projects that account for nearly all of that funding, more than 3.2 billion, are still operating and still serving communities across the country. So we had a success rate uh, based on dollars of, of almost 97%, 97, 98 percent. And I uh, don't believe you'll find another government grant program anywhere that's had that level of continued sustained success. Um, thank you. Now, with our infrastructure projects, we focused on building middle mile networks that would bring high speed services into an entire community or region. And our goal was to spur private sector investment by encouraging local internet service providers to connect to these networks to deliver service over the last mile to homes and businesses. And that's why all of the networks built with Recovery Act dollars had to comply with open access rules that we established that let all other carriers interconnect with these networks on fair and non-discriminatory terms. We also, as John mentioned, encouraged our grantees to connect directly to the key anchor institutions in these communities where the speed needs of schools and libraries and other institutions were substantially greater, at least at that time, uh, than for the community at large. And our focus on funding middle mile projects and on connecting community anchor institutions 
um, has helped extend our investments and ensured the long-term viability of these projects that we funded. The approach has paved the way for hundreds of broadband service providers across the country who have signed contracts with our grantees to connect end users to high-speed broadband service, thereby having a multiplier effect on our original investment. Um, indeed, our D Department of Commerce Inspector General just recently issued a report on sustainability that reported that three quarters of our grantees that they had surveyed had entered into interconnection agreements with other carriers, thereby allowing those carriers to extend their reach and reduce their costs. So for example, um, with the help of two NTIA grants, the Northwest Open Access Network, known as NOAANET, deployed more than 1,300 miles of fiber to reach areas of Washington State that previously had been unserved or underserved. This network now supports 61 last mile providers who have signed interconnect agreements with them, and those providers serve themselves over 260,000 customers. So it gives you a sense of, of how this investment worked and the multiplication of impact it had of the open access requirements. In southern Illinois, ClearWave Communications has connected 570 anchor institutions over its 1,500-mile network that was built with a $31 million grant from NTIA. And in addition, ClearWave now has interconnection agreements with 22 last-mile and cellular providers across southern Illinois. The economic impact study performed for us concluded that the communities helped by NTI grants experienced an estimated 2% greater growth in broadband availability than communities not receiving grants. And that growth is estimated to generate as much as $21 billion in annual economic activity. And at the same time, this additional infrastructure is expected to create and maintain more than 22,000 long-term jobs. But investing in infrastructure only addresses part of the broadband challenge. We must also focus on getting more people connected to these networks once they are built. And we've made progress on adoption in the last eight years. Nationally, the percentage of Americans subscribing to broadband service has increased from 68% in 2009 to nearly 75% in 2015. We funded $250 million of broadband adoption projects under the Act, and these projects generated more than 665,000 new household subscribers and provided more than 20 million hours of digital literacy training to residents across the nation. And this education is important because in our studies of households that do not use the internet, the top reason cited by these households for not being online is that they don't need it or don't have any interest in going online. And the second reason they give, of course, is the expense. They can't afford it. And we've taken all of these lessons from these adoption programs and collected them in a, our broadband adoption toolkit that now provides communities anywhere with step-by-step -step instructions on how to present effective broadband adoption programs to their citizens. And indeed, since the end of the grant program, we have refocused our entire broadband team on providing technical assistance to communities through the Broadband USA program. We work with communities across the country to provide guidance and technical assistance on the best ways to increase access to affordable broadband in their communities, on effective tools for expanding digital literacy and adoption, and to help them find the resources that might be available to assist them in these efforts. So for example, Broadband USA has been working with the city of Baltimore to expand its municipal fiber network to underserved public housing sites and public schools. And our team is also advising the city regarding its plans to build a world-class industrial zone around the Port of Baltimore that can attract and support global manufacturers, transportation, and logistics companies by providing high-speed, low-cost broadband. In addition to the Broadband Adoption Toolkit, we've developed a series of publications to assist communities, including our recently released Smart Cities Toolkit, which provides successful strategies for implementing Smart Cities projects. And we've also developed a stakeholder outreach toolkit uh, to help communities generate local awareness and support for their broadband projects. Many of you are aware of the work of our Broadband Opportunity Council. John mentioned that. It was created by President Obama in March of 2015 to bring key cabinet agencies together to figure out what actions the federal government could take to eliminate regulatory barriers to broadband deployment 
and to encourage investment in broadband networks and services. And I'm pleased to report that most agencies are making good progress toward completing the tasks they agreed to in the report, and many indeed have completed their work. As part of our council commitments, NTIA has developed and is now in the testing phase of its community connectivity initiative, an online self-assessment tool that will provide local leaders with benchmarks and indicators for assessing their own broadband needs in their communities. And on completion of this self-assessment tool, communities will receive a report with recommendations for how to improve their broadband capabilities, including referrals to Broadband USA's technical assistance experts. And we're aiming to have an official launch of this initiative in early 2017. So the last eight years have brought us measurable success, as well as the development of ongoing programs to build on those successes. And with all of this experience and knowledge of the last eight years, I'd like to leave you with some thoughts on what I see as the key lessons to guide future government efforts to expand broadband access and adoption. The first is we must focus on communities and the critical role they play in the success of any of these efforts. Communities must be involved in all aspects of broadband projects, including assessing the needs, building support among stakeholders, finding partners or securing funding and implementation. And this is why we have put so much of our emphasis on working with communities. They're our key client group um, as part of our Broadband USA program in ensuring that they are driving every stage of a project. Second, to the extent the government considers new funding to build broadband infrastructure, sustainability must be a top priority. It was one of our key factors in determining which projects to fund during the Recovery Act program. And as I noted earlier, our focus on sustainability has resulted in nearly all of our projects having survived on their own once the federal grant dollars were spent. And frankly, it makes little sense to utilize tax dollars to provide the capital to construct a project if the project can't generate the operating revenue needed to sustain that network in the future. Third, any new assistance program must ensure that dollars are provided to organizations that have a proven record of building and managing a broadband network. And they must be given the leeway to design their projects in a way to satisfy that requirement of sustainability. During the early days of the Recovery Act program, there were suggestions made to us about creating artificial boundaries within which to allocate the grant dollars. But had we adopted such approach, and deprive the applicants of the ability to find the service area in which they thought they could make a project work, then we would have had a far greater number of projects that failed with the result being wasted tax dollars. Fourth, to the extent any public money is uh, allocated to continue to expand middle mile networks, uh, I would strongly recommend we continue to require open access so that last mile providers can take advantage of that investment. It'll maintain that pump priming that we experienced in our grant program. And as, as you saw from our examples, that multiplication effect, the multiplier effect of allowing other providers to take advantage of that public investment with tax dollars uh, can lead to great benefits in communities across the country. So in conclusion, I'm very proud of the solid foundation that NTIA and the Obama administration has laid over the last eight years to connect communities across America and to expand the adoption of broadband services by many Americans. But it's clear there's more work to be done and we need to continue to learn and build on our successes. So going forward, NTIA has an enthusiastic team of experts in place who stand ready to work with communities, policymakers, and all of you in this room to continue building out the digital infrastructure needed to help our country compete in the global economy and to narrow the digital divide affecting many of our citizens. And so as I depart NTIA in a few weeks, my hope is that NTIA's strong record of accomplishment of the last eight years will be allowed to continue. So thanks very much for listening and good luck for the rest of your conference. to take a few questions from the audience while we're waiting for Senator Bozeman to appear. Uh, so is there a question? Yeah. Drew? Hey, Drew. Good question.
Don, <laughs> too kind. Larry, congratulations on your service. Uh, it, it's been great working with you. I'm Drew Clark with Best Best and Krieger, um, and um, I want to hone in on this last point you made uh, about the need to require open access on middle mile networks. I've been chatting with some in this room about their open access networks and the uh, private providers that were offering service on those. Could you just address whether NTIA has quantified how many uh, providers have taken advantage of those open access networks? You referred to Clear, Clear Wave's experience in Illinois. No, uh, yeah. but, but I'd just I'd love to get some specifics on that so that that can be an important uh, talking point going forward. Right. Well, as you know, Drew, from being close to our program, we had very detailed reporting requirements while the grants were still in operation. Um, but with the closeout of these grants over the last several years, those reporting requirements have gone away. So we don't today have current numbers. And, and again, it would be wonderful if uh, as part of whatever um, is developed uh, for next year, a going back and being able to update the data from all of those um, grantees would be an important part of that. I do know that uh, it's in the hundreds. We know that. I mean, that was the case at the, t at the end of our uh, reporting time, which would have been at this point, I think, several years ago. And as I said before, the Inspector General, when they came through and audited a bunch of these projects um, earlier this year, they concluded that 75 percent of the projects they looked at, and they looked at about half of the infrastructure projects, had interconnection agreements associated with them. I mean, frankly, if you're going to have sustainability, it's and, and and again, we're talking about middle mile networks. It's absolutely in the interest of the of the grantee or the organization building the middle mile to want to encourage as much interconnection as they can because that's revenue source for them, and it helps their sustainability. So we, one of the reasons that uh, I can only recall, uh, I think one interconnection dispute of any consequence during the entire eight years, and I think part of that is because the incentives are aligned, meaning the middle mile provider and those last mile providers both have an interest in and being able to utilize that middle mile infrastructure. And I think that is part of the reason we didn't have many disputes on it. Doug. I just wanted to mention that at the last count from our annual reports, uh, the number of uh, interconnection agreements was around 800. So, so Larry, I have a question for you, if you don't mind, but it's a difficult one. Okay. Uh, I'll, may, maybe I'll duck it then. <laughs> <laughs> so you talked about the lessons learned uh, about sustainability of these broadband projects uh, and how important that is to make good use of taxpayer dollars, which I totally agree with. I think the challenge becomes when you're trying to reach those really rural, hard to reach, high cost areas that may be difficult to sustain those networks just based on the economics of how, uh, how difficult it is to serve and generate the revenue to pay for those. So how do you propose, or do you have ideas for the next administration about how to extend beyond the top to get to those rural, hard to reach places that the economics may not justify sustainability on their own? So if we're speaking of a grant program, it's gonna take a lot more money than we had in 2009. And, and again, keeping in mind, we only had $4 billion to work with. Um, and some of that was already targeted for adoption programs, 250 million. We had to do 150 million of, of public computer centers. Um, and so when you look at the, the, the range of options available to you in terms of funding, um, we of course had a, a what we called the but for test on our funding. We couldn't fund anybody uh, for whom investing the capital themselves would have led to a, uh, a profitable project. So you take all the ones at that upper end who have a, um, an ability to generate enough uh, operating revenue to cover both their capital investment and their operating expense, and those were basically off limits to us. At the other end, you have the category of the projects you're talking about, which is not only do they need capital dollars, but they can't run without operating subsidies too. Because of the uh, scarcity of money we had, the limitation of funds, we basically took those off the table too. Um, and so what we focused on were the projects that um, really needed the capital investment. And, but if with that capital investment, they could demonstrate 
a solid business plan that was going to generate enough operating revenue to cover operating costs. And so those are the projects in the middle. Those were the ones we funded. And again, I think our results speak for themselves. Those projects have succeeded. So if you had a lot more resources, we'd need to have a different approach on how to deal with those program projects that would be at the, at the end of the scale where they need operating subsidies to continue because that was that would have been difficult for us to do um, in because we basically gave you know the money out to help people construct we weren't organized equipped and really authorized to be providing ongoing subsidies the FCC is of course uh, at least with the carriers that participate in their programs um, and so you know but this would take a lot of work and a lot of thinking in terms of how you might take a grant program to really reach those areas that um, are not are never going to generate enough operating revenue to be sustainable on their own. It's a tough, tough question. Yeah. Okay. I've got, uh, along that line, in the rural area, many of the uh, areas are served by independent telephone cooperatives. And if uh, the local communities bond and build and then work with a rural independent that has the experience to manage and operate, then you'd have a private um, public uh, mm -hmm. program where you could get the funding and then operate it and it would be the long-term revenue there when you do have that fiber that's the engine that drives economic right. development and there are many many uh, thousands of people that work from home over bandwidth the University of Minnesota has done quite an extension extensive study on 30 to 49 year olds wanting to move to the rural area but they have to have bandwidth so bring your job, bring your family, bring your paycheck, mm -hmm. and that, I think, is what can really work a, a, yeah. along your conversation. And, and you make an excellent point. And, and one thing I you know, didn't go out and make clear in my remarks is that in our case, we funded anybody who wanted to apply. So um, a perfect example of what you're talking about was South Dakota, where we funded a thing called the South Dakota Network, which were all of the incumbent uh, exactly. rural telephone companies that came together and presented a plan to us to build a middle mile network to connect everybody and Rich and, Boyd was involved in that yeah, yeah exactly. and it was a wonderful project that's been very successful and it does exactly what you did in many of our projects were public private partnerships of the oh, nature Bunyan. that you described telephone yeah. and Bemidji mm -hmm. another yeah. great success we have another question back there. I <laughs> ah, the great state of Maine. <laughs> Susan Corbett, Axiom Technology. You sure you don't want to save this for Senator King? I, well, okay. talk to him too, right? So, um, Washington County, Maine. So, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. Um, um, Axiom was a VTOP SBA recipient. We would just like to thank you for your leadership and guidance for so many years. And what you leave behind <coughs> is the foundation for all of us to work work on. So thank you again for, from all of us who you have been a great inspiration. All right. Well, thank you. And, and Susan, you've always been one of our favorite projects. <laughs> Blueberry farmers and lobster fishermen. You, you can't beat that for a project. <laughs> Secretary, sorry, great to see you. I'm Bill Valley. I was part of the State Broadband Initiative and proud to serve uh, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, we to, today thank in large part to NTIA's support, which made that possible on the state level. We have a state broadband office under the guidance of Ellen Katz right here, uh, and we're continuing our efforts. It's very difficult, though, on the state level, and so uh, could you speak to how perhaps NTIA going forward will continue its support of state government efforts? So our only tool is the Broadband USA program right now. I would love nothing better than to see an opportunity to resurrect the, the SBI program. I think it's, it, uh, again, we didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about its separate successes, but I think it was a very successful program on its own in terms of giving each state an opportunity to develop uh, resources within their own government in terms of people and programs, even grants that some states provided on their own. I think it was a very important piece of this because at the end of the day, the people who know their needs the best are the local people, the people in state government, the people in local government, and the ability to give every state the opportunity to tailor specific programs for themselves as well as take the responsibility for collecting and validating all of the data that went into the national broadband map. Um, you know, it was a tremendous <coughs> investment uh, that we put into that, and it hasn't had any funding now for two or three years and that's a real shame and so if folks have 
any way to think about bringing that back, I would certainly encourage you all to do that because it's a it, it was a marvelous tool. That map won a number of awards in terms of how it was designed and the accessibility of all that data at the time. Um, and it's a shame we haven't been able to keep it going. Don Means, Gigabit Libraries Network. Uh, Larry, it wasn't your responsibility or NTIAs, but could you speak to the experience, maybe lessons that you understood to have been learned under the, the loan program at uh, RUS? You know, I, I really don't have enough information to comment in, a, in a, even the least competent way about their program. And my sense is they ran into problems that we were able to avoid. I don't, I, I don't know what the reasons for that were and the implications of it. I know that um, unlike our program, which was built from the ground up uh, in 2009 and basically was built in 90 days, um, that money went into an existing program and maybe there were just issues in terms of how do you adapt an existing program that had been around for 60 years to get the kinds of results everybody was looking for. But I really don't know enough about it to give you any more than that in terms of observation. They're, they're preparing the senator. <laughs> Is he like the next? He's the next course. <laughs> uh, your uh, Broadband USA program uh, is intended to help communities, right. and this is an event about transforming communities. So, could you speak a little bit to how that technical assistance is working that NTIA is offering to provide communities? And come, do you have a, a list of communities that have signed up for that service, and how is that playing out? So, maybe I should let Doug answer that. Um, he, Doug Kinkoff, who runs the Broadband USA and indeed runs all of our broadband initiatives, um, could probably give you a more up-to-date uh, answer on that. As you might guess, since we don't have any money to give out, um, we're challenged. But what we do have to give is a tremendous amount of knowledge, tremendous amount of help, um, and the ability to uh, work hands-on with communities who are trying to figure out how to approach these questions. Um, and so what we're doing is very worthwhile. Obviously, at the end of the day, any community looking to expand broadband has got to find a partner or find a source of funding. And you know, with Recovery Act, we came with $4 billion. That helped. We don't have that anymore. Um, uh, so that somewhat limits our effectiveness. But nonetheless, Doug and his team have been doing great work uh, working with communities around the country. Doug? Yeah, so to date, we've, uh, for one-to-one -one technical assistance, we've provided to about 100, over 120 communities now in 32 states. Everything from early planning to funding to helping them with implementation. So um, we also provide group technical assistance in which we'll put on a webinar, et cetera, on a certain subject and communities can call in as they need. So it, it's, we have been limited, as Larry said. You know, I have a staff of technical assistance of about six so they all have a large portfolio. And, uh, but it's been very successful and very well received from the communities. But I will tell you the biggest thing is money for communities. and something we don't have. But something through the Bach and others, we've tried to generate ways that they can be educated about other federal funding streams, you know, venture capitalists on the private side, et cetera. There's a lot of interest. So part of it is also helping them uh, do a little bit of matchmaking with uh, the investment communities, et cetera. But that's kind of where we are today. Good morning. My name is Stephen Fulkerson, and I'm the Executive Director for the Arkansas Research and Education Optical Network. I am pleased to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, Senator John Bozeman from Arkansas. Senator Bozeman has been a U.S. Senator from Arkansas since 2011, after serving 10 years in the U.S. House of Representatives. In that short time, he has become one of the most influential senators over telecom and broadband issues. He serves as chairman of the Financial Services Subcommittee that has jurisdiction over the funding for the Federal Commission, Communications Commission. He's also a founding member of the Senate Broadband <laughs> Caucus. In his opening statement, Senator Bozeman said, connectivity is the vital infrastructure for the modern age. 
broadband is an is important is an important economic tool and we must provide all Americans with this 21st century building block. Please join me in welcoming welcoming our keynote speaker and former Razorback football player, <laughs> Senator John Poston. <laughs> Well, thank you all for having me. The, the Razorbacks aren't doing very well this year. The, I, my claim to fame at Arkansas when I was there was really two things. The, the uh, offensive line coach was Joe Gibbs. He was there the last two years I was there. He was coaching at USC, and uh, we signed a contract to play USC, so Coach Burroughs brought him over. And myself and two or three others frustrated him so much with being so uncoachable. He left college football and went to the pros. <laughs> and so when I, when I visit with him now, I say, you need to give me part of your retirement, you know, in the sense that, that I helped make you who you are. And the sad thing is he would agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> the other claim to fame was the quarterback then was a guy named Joe Ferguson, who uh, some of you older folks will remember, played at Buffalo for 19 years and for many, many years, was one of the longest playing quarterbacks uh, in the NFL. So I was offensive tackle. I was the left tackle. I was just like the guy on the blind side, only I never got any better. And uh, my guy would run over me, and Joe would have to run for his life. So I taught him how to scramble. And again, I tell him he needs to give me part of his retirement also. And sadly, he would nod his head that that's, he's in complete agreement with that. So. But this is really an important thing, and, and uh, you know, it's great to be here. It's great to see such a large crowd, and certainly everybody today here are champions of broadband, and uh, again, it's all about us working together so that we can span this important component for the 21st century infrastructure. We're used to thinking of infrastructure, and I've had the opportunity to be on the Environment and Public Works Committee now. Uh, I was on transportation in the House, and always in the past, we've thought of infrastructure as roads, bridges, ports, sewer systems, electrical grids, things like that. In our quickly technologically advancing world, we must include the internet as part of our infrastructure discussions and support its expansion as a tool to improve and empower society. At the beginning of the 20th century, electricity was a luxury. Uh, but as the use of this new technology increased, so did investments into the infrastructure. It became a necessity for businesses to prosper and for families to thrive, and, and really, uh, in, much of, uh, in much of the United States, uh, Arkansas included, in fact, Arkansas for sure, uh, you know, you still had uh, areas, large areas of the state up until the 1950s, you know, that, that had problems with electricity. Today, we're facing similar challenges, and the need to bridge the digital divide exists, uh, that, it, that does exist is paramount. Digital infrastructure like high-speed internet is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. My home state of Arkansas is a good example of where that digital divide currently exists. And uh, this was an election year. I was up for re-election, was fortunate enough to get re-elected, re but all over the state of Arkansas, uh, you know, all over the state of Arkansas anyway, but particularly in the last year and a half, to all the little hamlets and things, it's remarkable uh, how many how many areas simply don't have basic uh, basic service? The FCC's broadband progress report released earlier this year shows that 25 percent of Arkansans don't have access to broadband, and even for those people who do have access, they lack the the quality internet speed that they need. When we launched the Senate Broadband Caucus, uh, and I think uh, Senator Klobuchar and, and Senator King are going to speak this afternoon, who are just doing an outstanding job, and and again, that just shows how bipartisan this effort is, you know, the, the, which is so, so very important about it. I heard from many Arkansans about the challenges they face trying to get quality services. One constituent recently moved to a new home to be closer to his job as a physician. He and his wife wanted to homeschool their children, but the lack of access to quality internet services was forcing his family to reevaluate their decision. Another Arkansas said these days the internet should be considered a necessary utility, and with that I agree. Access to high quality high-speed internet has quickly become the cornerstone 
of a prosperous economy and is the backbone for economic innovation, transforming every sector of our economy, including health care and education. I was pleased that the Senate passed the Expanding Capacity for Health Outcomes Act, or ECHO for short, uh, that will help telemedicine. This legislation, among other things, will help academ academic hubs such as the University of Arkansas for Medical Science in Little Rock uh, connect medical specialists with local clinicians through video conferencing technology to provide medical education and recommendation, recommended specialty care for complex conditions and diseases. And that's something that truly is transforming uh, medicine and it's so important as we reach rural communities where it's, it's harder and harder to find providers. I'm an optometrist by training, so after I get done, if you need any advice about your cataracts or glasses or whatever, I'll be able to, to give you some free advice about that. I like to be introduced as an optometrist. That's a respected profession. <laughs> uh, I think our approval rate in the Senate and Congress is, is probably about 13%, which we're grateful for. That's actually up a little bit. That's basically friends, uh, family, and uh, <laughs> the people that work for you. <laughs> Solutions like this are the way of the future, and we must ensure that rural communities have dependable broadband access to, to ensure success. Communities around Arkansas have come together to find these solutions with limited resources. Libraries are certainly on the front line of the digital divide, providing access to students, uh, those who don't have internet access at home, entrepreneurs who run small businesses, uh, using library connectivity, and job seekers creating resumes and submitting online job applications. Broadband is an important economic tool in all sectors. For every five billion invested in broadband infrastructure, 250,000 jobs are created. And with every percentage point increase in new broadband distribution, employment expands by 300,000 jobs. More than a decade ago, the, the Monday after uh, Thanksgiving was coined Cyber Monday. I imagine that like my wife Kathy, your inbox was full of uh, uh, emails from stores offering discounts to all kinds of things. And uh, many succumbed to that. And it's amazing the increase in the, in the volume of the, uh, you know, of the internet uh, business. The internet is a 21st century staple and we need to ensure all Americans, no matter where they live, are able to access it. Public-private partnerships are certainly vital to accomplish this. Private companies are working to expand next generation broadband internet services of Arkansas and across the country. I'm excited that the opportunities uh, that the Arkansas Electric Co-ops are providing to people with new business ventures in our state that will deliver some of the fastest speeds available, including fiber, to homes. I'm proud to join public and private sector leaders who share the goal of expanded broadband because to achieve this, it has to be a joint effort. This conversation about broad, broad, broadband is necessary. We can find ways to partner together and ensure all Americans have access to quality internet. I look forward to working uh, with the Senate Broadband Caucus and all stakeholders to underserved areas. Again, thank you all for letting me be here. I'll be glad to answer any questions or, or really probably as important, maybe more important, any comments that you've got, things that, that you see that we need to be working on. The answer to these things is not going to come from a, a piece of legislation or this or that. It really is going to come from the, the public-private partnerships. And, uh, and that's really where we depend on you all so much to come up with those solutions as we move forward. We got any easy questions or comments? Or we'll talk about anything you want to talk about. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, I'm Debbie Goldman, Communication Worker America. We represent many folks in Arkansas who are building, maintaining, and servicing the networks there. Can you give us any insight at all into what you would see as aspects of infrastructure in the next administration and what the Senate might be looking at? Well, I think it's really difficult to know exactly what, you know, what the next administration is going to be doing. If you listen to the rhetoric that we've heard, uh, and I think it's been well received, is certainly that we need to work on an infrastructure. And as I mentioned earlier, 
you know, you can't just think in terms of infrastructure, roads and bridges, sewer systems and things like that. Certainly all of those things are a necessity, but, but you do have to think in terms of broadband. I'll give you an example I was thinking about the other day uh, when I was thinking about this. Uh, right now we've got a lot of people that are wanting to come to the inauguration. We've had a lot of people that wanted to come to President Obama's inauguration, President Bush's inauguration. Uh, this year, um, the, uh, you know, you do that basically by contacting us, but you also get online, you know, and make it such you know, that you place your, your order, you know, for whatever. Uh, right now, if you want a job in the administration, uh, I'm the senior senator from Arkansas. When I was in the House, it was, I was kind of in a unique situation. I was the only Republican in the delegation under the Bush years. And so I helped with the, the appointments of the federal judges from the state, the, the um, uh, prosecuting attorneys, district prosecutors, things like that. Now, you know, you do two things. You contact me and Senator Cotton about those things. But most importantly, you fill out a form, you know, the, to the transition team online. So the list just goes on and on and on. And it really is a problem in the sense that uh, Healthcare is moving in that direction greatly. Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. Well, in many parts of Arkansas, uh, you know, uh, so many of these people are elderly. You know, they, they don't have the knowledge. Uh, sometimes they don't have the, the uh, abilities, the resources to buy the things. But probably most importantly, the areas, the rural areas, simply don't have the ability uh, without paying through the nose. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, I think that that it will be very supportive. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, the economy and helping middle class, lower middle class, just getting the economy rolling, which would be good for everybody in this room. And, and I think that uh, again, you know, broadband is is an integral part of that. So for lots of different reasons, I, I think that it will. And certainly the broadband caucus, Democrats, Republicans in the Senate working together and uh, the same in the House are going to push that along. So. Hi, Senator. I'm Hans Reamer. I'm a local elected official here in Montgomery County, Maryland, right outside district. About 40 percent of our county is farmland, uh, not well known. Um, but I was just interested in your perspective on the scrappy municipal governments across this country in rural areas that are working so hard to bring broadband access to their communities. And they're often doing it now against uh, the, you know, against the will of their state legislatures or uh, of other uh, entities. So um, it seems to me if, if the federal government wanted to make a priority connecting rural America, it could just be done. You know, five, ten years, you could, you could make it happen. Um, but someone has to be willing to clear the barriers to that. Just interested in your view on, on that issue. No, I, you know, certainly it does need to be a priority, and it does need to be up towards the top. The problem is, uh, whether it's the federal government or you, you know, at the local level, uh, there are lots of priorities and there's limited resources. And, and that's why, again, I think the public-private, uh, you know, if we're just going to sit around and wait for government to do it, it's not going to get done. Uh, so government can be very, very helpful. They can push. They can make it from a regulatory uh, atmosphere that it's easier to do, you know, things like that, speed up the process and those kind of things, but it's not going to do it all. Uh, and again, you know, we've got all kinds of problems uh, that take a lot of money. And, and again, you know, with a $20 trillion debt and $500 billion deficits, it's not like we're not spending, you know, money. So uh, we are going to have to work hard to make it such that we we make sure that it is a priority, again, working with people like yourself, you know, that, to try and figure out uh, the best way forward. And the challenges that you face with your constituency are different than some of the challenges that are faced in rural Arkansas or rural Maryland or rural, you know, rural Virginia. So it's just a matter of not having a one-size-fits-all, you know, those things don't work, but really empowering uh, you know, the various components that are going to make all this work uh, to come together and figure out, like I say, how we can get that done. Very much. Yes, ma'am. You had a question. 
Good morning. I'm Ellen Katz. I'm the consumer advocate from the state of Connecticut, and I'm um, very appreciative of your comments, and I hope you will show leadership in the next administration on making broadband access a priority. Um, one uh, issue that has continually come up in the conversations I've had with people across the country is opening up public rights of way to new infrastructure investment, new infra infrastructure deployment, and I think the FCC can have um, a crucial role in either helping enabling that or perhaps making it more difficult. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on what the role of the <coughs> FCC in the future might be in um, making those public rights of way more available to all kinds of uh, potential investment companies and new companies, not just necessarily the existing incumbents. Uh, uh, you know, certainly they're going to, the FCC is going to play a, a major role in, in going forward, you know, with these things. Uh, and what I would like to see is, is, and again, we'd have to talk about this, you know, the real specifics of what you're talking about, but, but all of these things is, is have a regulatory atmosphere, and certainly we need regulation. I mean, there's no ifs, ands, and buts. But, uh, you know, have an atmosphere that, that we do feel like it's important, you know, this is a priority, and to make it such that we, that we can go forward in an expeditious way and not have stuff laying around on somebody's desk, okay? So we do need to, you know, we need to, to look at the FCC's funding, uh, you know, make sure it's adequate, make sure that they're using the dollars that they, they've got wisely, and then kind of go from there. But yeah, I think, I think everybody's committed to, you know, to doing that. I'll give you a good example of that. If you remember the uh, the bridge, uh, Minneapolis bridge, you know, it fell down. I-35. Yeah, that uh, that was rebuilt in a year. Uh, any any major construction project now probably takes the average is probably ten years, and that one would have taken much longer, <laughs> uh, except for the fact that you know you had all of the different agencies involved, whether it was OSHA or, or this or that, and you know, there's a multitude of agencies that, that, you know, you have to have everything signed off. They basically were on the site, and rather than have an adversarial gotcha attitude, you know, it was do this, you know, and this will keep you out of trouble, and this and that. And as a result, they were really able to, uh, to, achieve, to achieve a remarkable, you know, achievement in getting that thing done in a very, very timely way. There's no reason not to do that, and, and that's, that's not only efficient, but it saves money. Uh, the difference in building that, you know, in a year versus stretching it out, you know, for many, many years with inflation and, and this and that, there's, you know, there's no comparison. So those are things that we can work on, you know, in government that don't, don't cost any money. It's just making government more efficient. And it's easier said than done, you know, so. What else have we got, anything? Love to have everybody join me in thanking Senator Bozeman. Any eye questions? <laughs> and while uh, while the next panel's coming up, I just want to mention to the folks in the back there are some seats here and there. Feel free to take this moment and find one. And there's also an overflow room next door. <laughs> okay, so while we're, while we're doing a little transition, I thought I'd note we didn't have all the same chairs and we had a choice between a throne and this. And uh, I begged for the throne, but they thought it would be dangerous. I wouldn't be able to leave with the size of my head. Um, I'm Chris Mitchell. I'm the policy director for Next Century Cities, which I do uh, within my capacity as a researcher at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And I'm moderating the panel today. Uh, we're going to try and do very brief introductions so that we can get right into a discussion format. 
And <laughs> hello, Ed. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and uh, we are going to try and keep it uh, quick and light, and then go to audience questions. So uh, start thinking about questions. We'll have the mics and uh, move into that. Um, we are going to do, a, like I said, a discussion format. The first question will actually be going to Dana in a second. Um, and then um, anyone that has a thought from the panel can just speak into their microphone. We're going to make it hard on the people that are doing the mixing. Uh, I have other questions. I'll jump in as we go through. But don't feel like you have to wait for me to recognize you if you would like to contribute something. So start on the end with uh, Mayor Burke from City of Chattanooga, uh, superintendent of the, Bal of the uh, I'm sorry, Dallas. Um, uh, yes. Sorry, I should have just done this in order that I had written down. Dallas Dance. Um, I was thinking your name is so alliterative, I could not forget it. Uh, Baltimore County Public School System uh, Superintendent. Um, we have Ed Bostic, who is the, um, the Executive Director, Ed, the ED, of the Colorado Telehealth Network. Uh, Mayor Dana Kirkham from Ammon, Idaho. And Carrie Coogan, the Deputy Director of the Kansas City Public Library System. Uh, so uh, I'd like to ask the first question to Mayor Kirkham. Uh, which is to say that you come from a rather rural and conservative community. Um, although having been there, I'll, I'll say that it didn't really strike me as you know anything other than a great little city. Um, and uh, the region, you have cable, you have DSL. I don't want people to have the wrong impression, but we're curious uh, what you did to make sure you had the connectivity that you wanted to have moving forward. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Christopher, for uh, involving me in this panel because I definitely represent the boots on the street in rural communities and um, it's nice to have a, a seat at the table. So, um, well first I have to point out that I come from an extremely conservative area of the country. In fact, maybe the most conservative area of the country. And um, so anytime government decides to act or move or intervene, it's treated with a lot of suspicion. So uh, the fact that that makes our municipal fiber even more interesting, I think, because of that. But I think the reason that we've been successful are two things, and I, it's more philosophical maybe than logistical, but the first thing is we have invested in infrastructure. And so we consider ourselves an infrastructure provider and not an internet provider. And often you see, we use that analogy of you build the road and anyone can play on it, you know, FedEx, UPS, whatever. So, and then the second thing I think is we took it a step further. And so when you talk about public-private partnership, and we've talked about that already today, we aren't partnering with FedEx or UPS. We're partnering with the end user. We're partnering with the customer, the homeowner, the person who receives the package. And the result of that is that our customer owns a dedicated fiber line to their home or to their business, and then they're free to innovate and do with it whatever they choose. Wonderful. And I think we'll talk more about that. If people have more specific questions, we can get into it. Um, I'm, I have more directed questions, but um, and I think we'll go there, actually. Um, Ed, I'd like to ask you about um, a different question in, in terms of rural Colorado. I think you've been active in trying to make sure that the FCC programs are maximally benefiting uh, the, the health system. Uh, can you just tell us a little bit about what's going on and what you'd like to see uh, in terms of uh, changes in the future? Sure. Uh, uh Again, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, as far as Colorado goes, I, I would just like to say that I don't speak for Colorado, but I agree with everything that's been said so far this morning, uh, especially about the idea that uh, broadband is a utility. And I think if we start thinking about in terms of that, that will trickle down to all sorts of uh, ramifications as far as regulatory, uh, procedural, and uh, legislative issues are around that. Uh, as far as working with the FCC, uh, we uh, uh, are very much a proponent of uh, the intent of Congress uh, to make sure that every community has broadband infrastructure and uh, utilities. However, uh, we believe that there is much that can be done as far as being able to uh, loosen up the reins, make it less prescriptive and to actually be able to uh, meet the various needs of communities. And we've been able to do that by leveraging uh, funds from the FCC, uh, from various uh, other pots of money uh, for the health care, uh, the E-rate, uh, schools, libraries, those kinds of things. So we're working in communities as well as uh, anchor institutions, which is health care, our portfolio. And to be able to do that, then we need to think beyond uh, just the incumbent provider and get to the idea of redundancy. And if you'll just permit me one example, uh, we have uh, in uh, Grand Junction, Colorado, uh, 
uh, mental health uh, hospital, a psychiatric hospital. It's the only one between Denver and Salt Lake. And they were trying to open a new building uh, that included uh, both clinical and administrative staff, and they could not get the new building built uh, opened in time because of the broadband uh, inability uh, to make that connection. And so therefore, they lost uh, patients, revenue, uh, a lot of reputation and everything else in that community, and that goes on. Uh, a couple of years ago, the 719 ladder went out in southern Colorado, and we had to actually transport patients uh, to the next larger hospital because the physicians could not work with the patients because they couldn't access their records, their uh, public health records, or uh, uh, access information from the cloud as well. So those are just two examples why we need redundancy in our thinking when we're thinking about utilities. Uh, Dallas, I'd like to turn to you and talk about the homework gap just briefly. Superintendent of the Baltimore Public Schools, what are you doing in order to try and make sure that everyone's able to get the full educational benefits of the modern technology allows us? Sure. So um, I've been the superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools now in my fifth year. And one thing to keep in mind, Baltimore City and Baltimore County are two separate school systems. We are a horseshoe uh, around Baltimore City. We serve about 112,000 students in about 173 schools. And we have about 700 square miles. So our school system goes all the way up to the Pennsylvania state line. Rural, urban, and suburban America exist in Baltimore County Public Schools. So in 2012, we set on a journey of every student his or her own laptop just so that we can provide sort of a personalized learning experience for them. As digital content becomes more um, exacerbated, we wanted to make sure that it was, it was dynamic for our students. It wasn't a static textbook for them. And so we recognized throughout the school day, we have connected all of our schools. We've been able to leverage partnerships with the FCC through E-Rate and so forth. And so where all of our schools are connected now, we partner with our county government around um, fiber and making sure that we're connecting the community along with the schools. My concern, though, is that when kids get home, many of them are not connected. Um, and we, even when we do a survey of asking families, Families, you know, do you have access to broadband? To them, that means on my smartphone, can I get internet? Right? And so we know that in many cases, many of our families are sharing those types of connections. So um, we've been working very closely with organizations such as ISTE, AASA, which is the School Superintendents Association, to really leverage the fact that there is a homework gap when kids go home. They're connected with school, but when they get home, they're not connected. And what really concerns me is rural America. Uh, particularly where when you think about the 700 square miles, we have over 250 square miles, it's all rural America, where I have schools that we are barely connecting, and when we're connecting them, it's quite slow. Um, so that is a, a challenge that we have going forward. As we've been able to leverage and give kids their own devices, we have been able uh, to partner with service providers to give broadband access within the device. So it's almost like we're checking out for students the device, uh, and then they actually get the broadband to take home, and we control the gigabyte access. But even then, that's not enough. So I'll just say in Chattanooga, we, we've done some of the same studies. We've tried to figure out when, uh, when we give kids these devices, do they turn them on at home and take a look at that. And what we find is they're leaving them at school. They don't take them home, even though we have uh, broadband that goes to every home. And so I would just think about this. You know, in Chattanooga, we've started to think about this in two ways. One is we have access issues. And the two, second part is we have literacy issues. So if you have a culture at, at the house that doesn't, use the internet, even if you have access, um, people are told, kids are told, don't turn on that device and play, you need to do your homework. And for us, we've really tried to figure out how we solve both this access issue, which is important, do they have something to turn on, but then second of all, is there an encouraging, welcoming environment to getting on the internet? Um, and if the parents don't have digital literacy, then it's very hard for them to get their kids to do that, just like everything else at home, which I know you you work on as well. No, I think that's a very valid point. And if I can just say one, one quick thing, we've been able to connect our parents more through a system that we call BCPS1. Um, so this is a one-stop shop that we have where you get your kids grades, their attendance, their discipline, all their assignments, and it's in real time. So we have uh, over 70% of our parents who are connected to us through BCPS1 where they're going on at least two to three times a week just to check on uh, their students' progress. And in many cases, they're asking questions of kids that they already know the answers to because they've checked it at home. And so we've been able to tell our parents, use the device. Um, and as a matter of fact, even parents who have access to another device at home, we're encouraging them to use ours because the internet safety fil uh, filter that's on there, even when you connect, whether it's at our schools, at your home, or in our public libraries, it still goes to that internet safety filter. 
So I'm so glad to hear you both talk about that because I think it continues to be a real difficult problem. And in the Kansas City Public Library, we partner very exclusively and directly with the Kansas City, Missouri Public School District because in our district, we found out, uh, again, we had the one-to-one -one program, so all the students were given a, a laptop or a tablet of something, uh, some kind, but then uh, literally after the fact, uh, the school district realized that 70% of the families inside the school district did not have connectivity at home, which is terrible, right? I mean, here you're trying to bridge the homework gap and you don't have any access at home. So the library has stepped in and we do our hotspots for learning program. So we check out hotspots to um, entire to the student, but there's use for the entire family. And in, in addition to offering use for the entire family and for the student for classwork, um, we also provide um, adult literacy and digital literacy classes for the parents and whoever the caregiver is at the home and children can also access those classes as well. So we've also um, brought in other community partners. Connecting for Good is a, is a local um, organization that also provides classes. So we've tried to collaborate with other organizations to help provide the services that are desperately needed within these communities and within these families and homes. And I would just say that as we ha we've so sort of exposed a, a weakness as we've moved to the home and uh, the businesses, we see that there's a gap with, with rental properties because there doesn't seem to be as much incentive to uh, invest in the infrastructure. And so unfortunately, there you see a huge homework gap because often children that are in these rental properties don't have access. And we haven't quite decided how to solve that, but that's definitely on our mind. Yeah, I think we face uh, similar issues as far as aging in place, people being able to stay in their homes, being able to access uh, good information as far as health and what the community provides for them. I know Senator Boozman was talking about being a good citizen by being on the internet, being able to file information, being able to uh, uh, check and see if there's opportunities for boards and commissions and being able to check exactly what are the regulatory requirements for whatever it may be, whether it's civic or municipal or, or whatever. Uh, but this also extends to healthcare as well, being able to get the information, being able to understand when Meals on Wheels is being delivered, being able to understand uh, when somebody is, is making uh, quite frankly, uh, suspicious moves in the neighborhood. All of those kinds of things help people stay in place, help people age in place, and if we're able to achieve that, then we can certainly drive down the cost of health care, certainly by transportation, certainly by deinstitutionalizing uh, seniors, and uh, I think I'm fast approaching that, so I, would, I certainly have a vested interest in that. Uh, but making sure that fiber to the home, uh, fiber to the community, uh, leveraging with anchor institutions such as libraries and schools and government entities, all of those kinds of things come into play and this seems to be a strategy that's happening nationwide. Uh, certainly I think Colorado is part of that strategy and we want to be able to express the actual opportunity uh, for seniors and those folks who have comorbid conditions and we know that so many of them, uh, doesn't matter what the uh, medical uh, uh, diagnosis is uh, that also usually accompanies some form of, uh, form of depression. And so if we're able to get uh, psych, uh, caregivers, uh, all of that surrounding support community uh, that comes with aging in place then, I think we've done a lot to achieve the triple aim, uh, but as far as driving down healthcare costs, there's probably a lot, lot of low hanging fruit that we can achieve there. So as we're on the subject of the digital divide, I'm, I'm curious um, if we can look at this in terms of where we're going to solve this problem. We've seen wonderful organizations like Connecting for Good, both in Boston and in Chattanooga. Um, E2D out of the, the Northern Charlotte area is, is, is incredible. These local bottom-up um, solutions. Uh, is that going to be sufficient? Um, and I'm, I'm, you, those, some of you are working with them um, more or less directly. Um, or do we need more levels of government getting involved? And if so, which levels of government? Well, I, th I think we need all of those things, actually. I think that's one of the most important things is collaboration and, and getting as many people to the table as possible, including you know, government um, government uh, municipalities. And I like the gentleman who said that municipalities are scrappy. I feel like all of us in this work are scrappy, right? We have to come up with ways to, to deliver services and, and connectivity. But I feel like um, we, were one of, we were the first city that Google Fiber came into. Um, and one of the first things that we did was figure out how can we capitalize on this opportunity. Opportunity. And so 
one of the first things we did was created the Kansas City Digital Inclusion Coalition, which consisted of everyone that you're talking about, nonprofits, anchor institutions, schools, libraries, um, city government, providers, business leaders, anybody we could get to the table to discuss the best ways that we could begin to come together and figure out what we needed to do to make things work. So from my, from my perspective and from the experiences that we've had, you need everybody at the table. You need all of those people to, de to determine what is best for your community. And if you try something and it's not working, you should stop and try something else. I mean, don't, don't continue down a road when it's not working. I mean, this is a, a frontier for all of us. So I think one of the central questions that we face is whether technology is going to grow equity or inequity. Um, if you think about it, it has potential to do both. Um, so it has a ch the chance to grow inequity because uh, when we look at peer-to-peer uh, -peer businesses, which Chattanooga has some as well, you see people sitting in offices uh, making, uh, writing code and making their companies great while people in the real world are working as independent contractors with no benefits for small amounts of money. And, and that has really big ramifications for what, you know, what our economy looks like. It also has the chance to grow equity because we know that if we evenly distribute um, the chances and the opportunity to be part of the digital world that we can in fact give more opportunity to people that didn't exist before and the internet gives tremendous individual power uh, for people to to express themselves and to find opportunity but uh, i was in a, I, I get a chance to go to some other cities and talk to them a little bit about what's happening in chattanooga just for those of you who don't know chattanooga uh, was the one of the first gig cities if not the first gig city we have a municipally owned network that goes 600 square miles to every single home and business in the entire area not some homes not some businesses every single one and they were talking about um trying to get three and five meg uh to to some this is a you know big city and they were sitting there having this ongoing conversation about trying to get three and five meg in chattanooga now um we have 10 10 gig we're, we're at 10 gig. And I said, this is literally the definition of inequity. Uh, you've got people at 10, 10 gig, and there are people who are trying to figure out how they get three and five meg. Um, what, what does that mean in an economy and in a world of education that is increasingly relying on the digital aspects? And I want to actually come back to that in a second, uh, the, the difference between what's commonly available and what several of you have, have built or, or have available. But I want to just push back in on this for a second to ask, I, mean, I think what we're talking about is in terms of digital divide and who's not online, there's two primary factors that you can boil it down to. One is cost and two is culture. And so I'm curious, in particular with the culture, is this something that we just need time and nonprofit organizations to chip away at? Or do we need to do fundamental, something fundamentally different than what we're seeing bumbling up? Well, since I'm from the red state and very conservative, I'll be the one to, God forbid, say the word regulation. But um, I do think that, you know, Building, we look at, for instance, electricity, and when electricity came in, you know, and how it all evolved through, throughout the country, we have, when we build a home, we say you have to have 200 amps. Well, you may never use 200 amps, but your, your house has to be built for it. So I think if we're really going to treat this as a utility, if we're really going to say broadband is a utility, then we have to say there is a minimum level of service that's required at every home, and, and it has to be built future proof. We have to say that it's like when you go to the store and you buy a small appliance, you never worry about bringing it home and will it work or not. You know that it will, but how often do you go buy broadband technology and wonder if it will work if your if your system will support it? Well, I would just say that a part of what it cost is a factor of is value. So, do if people don't know how to use it, then it doesn't matter whether they're paying $5 a month, it's still too much. And so there is a big culture issue here that we have to solve. Um, in Chattanooga, uh, a couple years ago, we said that any family who had a child on free or reduced lunch um, can get the internet at the lowest, our, our 100 megs at the lowest price allowed by law. We're trying to drive that, but again, even at that reduced rate, it's still too much. People don't know what, what to do with it. And so part of what we have to make sure of is that there really is this literacy push as well and that we don't think that access solves everything because at some point uh, people have to know, listen, if you live in a food desert, you can order food online that gets there. That can change your life. That makes that 
$15 a month or whatever it is that you have to pay look a little bit different than it does if you just say, well, this is just good for you. We promise it is, um, and you should get it. Back to that uh, scrappy comment, I think that was in the context of municipalities opting out of agreements with incumbent carriers uh, to be able to uh, set up their own broadband networks in their uh, mun municipal areas. And I think I heard from Deb uh, Associate this morning that uh, Colorado has done that in 93 municipal areas. I have not heard that number. Jeff, is that a true is that a true number, 93? Okay, I, it's, I was it's going about... High, it's in the middle 90s in terms of the number of local... Um, uh, so almost half of the counties. Yes. And then uh, that's, a, that's about 20-some counties. And, yes, and, 70 and uh, some cities none of them have voted not to do that. It's, right, right. It's Everyone that's had a vote. And um, so all of those votes have been overwhelming as well. And so this gets back to the idea of redundancy. Yes, broadband is necessary. Yes, it is a utility and everything else. But because of the very nature of the services that it provides, the functionality that it provides for the cohesiveness of communities, there has to be redundancy as well. There has to be some challenge to organizations who live by quarterly stock reports who have responsibilities to stockholders and uh, to their chairs and to their C-suites, there has to be some response to that. And it needs to be not prescriptive. It needs to be community-centric. And so if I could advocate for anything like that, I would say that redundancy, if we shoot for redundancy, then maybe we can hit at least ubiquity on one level anyway. So I want to I want to go through one more broader topic before we open it up for questions, and that is this delta between what may be commonly available and the best, whether it's a gig or ten gigs, and and let's not um, if we can silo it to some extent to the way um, you know not just talking about residents and businesses, but think more broadly the the kind of um, community anchor institutions U.S. Ignite and Shelby work with or Schlub, which I really like, um, <laughs> um, which is uh, the the local institutions. So whether we want to talk about the difference between between having three and five megabits in our classrooms or 100 megabits or a gigabit in our classrooms or in the home. I'm curious, those of you who have seen that difference, what is that difference between the base level better than dial-up access and truly next generation access? Well, I, I'm a proud member of uh, Shelby and uh, formerly known as Schlub. Uh, <laughs> But as far as the difference between dial-up, because we were talking about this 20 years ago, what is the reason for even having all of this stuff? We're still having the same conversation, uh, but it's become much more apparent to us, intuitive. However, we don't have the research behind it to make a case that it does uh, lower health care. Uh, cost to actually age in place, to have communities take care of their community, uh, the people in those communities. When we think about veterans having to travel 200 miles uh, for a particular procedure because there's nothing in the area that, that can host veterans for their particular causes, that doesn't even make sense. And if we can put in an economic formula uh, research-based uh, that, that makes sense as far as the evidence goes, then I think it would be apparent why we would want to make uh, investments in these alternate utilities, if, if I can use that word. And I'm sorry, Andy. Um, Dallas, would you mind? It looked like you were about to speak. Well, I looked at you because, uh, you know, we can get into sort of the, the technical of how much, but let's imagine a classroom with one teacher, 28 to 32 kids in there, which is the average class size across the country. We tell a teacher to act, we ask a teacher to go out on a limb and do something, take a risk, and it doesn't work, that teacher's not doing that ever again. So at the bottom line classroom level, we can talk about the technical spot, uh, things on the, on the back end. It needs to work. And it needs to work to where if you think about the, the, the digital curriculum that's driving instruction today, all of our textbook companies are now moving more digital content online because it becomes more fluid. Right? I give the story of when I was a teacher in 2011, uh, 2001, when we wanted to talk about 9-11, there was nothing in a textbook for about five years to talk about 2001. But however, the internet had stories the next day that could guide classroom conversations. And so as that's the case, and we have streaming media and so forth, we need to make sure that we constantly look at and assess our broadband capacity at our schools so that as students are online, school systems can adjust based on the, ba the bandwidth they'll in fact need. So that's why I looked at you a little bit uh, on that end, because to the teacher, the teacher doesn't care how many megs or how many gigs the school system has. They want to make sure that whenever he or she asks students to do something and they turn them on, that it works. 
Right, or That's, I would say sorry, even the... Can I just follow up with him for one second? I'm really interested in what you have to say, but I wanted to clarify something, which is, do all of your classrooms have the service? When we look at surveys, it's surprising how many schools don't have the service that will allow that to happen. Do all of your schools have that today? They actually have it now. Uh, when I got to Baltimore County in 2012, we only had about 35% of our schools that, in fact, had it. And it bothered me that kids could go to McDonald's or Starbucks, but they couldn't go to their classrooms in order to get this. When we did our own self-assessment, we actually knew that it would cost about $12 million in order to outfit all of our classrooms with it and over a two-year period we did it so it became a priority for us and that's where we put our resources but I would have principals going to Best Buy to actually buy wireless routers and I get it as a former principal I would have done the same thing but I would have PTAs who are raising money that was causing an even further inequity because some PTAs could afford it and some couldn't so we actually did a system-wide uh, infrastructure investment for 12 million for all of our 9,000 classrooms Great. And so, Carrie, and then we'll come back to Mayor Burke. Well, I just uh, would agree with that. The same thing happened in Kansas City, Missouri. And once we had it, it, it was very important. But I also think if, if you're trying to show the value to people, if you're trying to get them excited about what the value of the Internet is, whether that's educational opportunities or career opportunities, if, if it's a subpar – uh, if it's if it's not good, why why would they? How do you sell them on that? If you're giving them the worst possible technology, why would they get excited about it? Why would they want to continue to learn? I mean, they're already starting at a difficult place anyway. Many of them learning how to read on a computer, learning how to use a computer, and if it's not good technology, then how do you get them excited? So that's so why I think it's so important to have good quality. So are you saying that, that your concern is to some extent some of these programs that are $10 a month programs that have uh, three, five, or maybe caps. even yeah, tag, um, yeah. or monthly caps that, so to some extent the FCC has tried to deal with this and I think they've been heard, but that's something that really concerns you is, is that someone would not continue to use the internet if they have a bad experience because their connection is of insufficient quality when they first connect. Well, don't get me wrong. I, I do think that programs that the FCC are trying to do are very important, particularly Lifeline. Those are, these are opportunities for people to have access that have never Never had access before but I also think it's important that we think about the bigger picture which is that if we want people to see the value and get excited about it then we have to offer them the same kind of technology that we're all using I think that's a tremendous comment that I don't hear enough at events like this um, mayor Burke well you I think the question was just about the value of the speed and let's let's be honest first of all Netflix is incredible Netflix is incredible um, as it get far. Uh, second of all, and maybe maybe more importantly, um, as as somebody who has seen the economy change, we we know that the the gig and our internet speed and reliability is important. So I'll give you two quick examples. One is a company called South Tree. They take those old videotapes that you have and they digitize it. They throw it up on the web because we have the fastest, cheapest, most pervasive internet in the world. They can put it up on the web and on the cloud at a higher resolution uh, than any other company. You know, they're growing with a couple hundred people in Chattanooga. Second part is last week I was, or a couple weeks ago, I was at a company called Squid. Um, and a year ago, they were at 30. They're at 125. By the end of next year, they're going to be at 300. And um, they do um, some of the the um, work that goes on top of Salesforce. They said the only reason they're in Chattanooga is because of the speed and reliability of our network. Okay, 300 jobs in a company like that in a city like Chattanooga. That's economic development. That's what it looks like. So I want to see if there's any questions. And while we have a question here, we'll get a mic over there. Um, while that mic's heading over there, I want to follow up. You hit a sore point with me with Netflix. And, and I think people chuckled a little bit in the audience. And there's some people that will undoubtedly say, well, this is not sufficiently important to really, you know, Netflix is an entertainment kind of thing. Netflix drives real estate prices to some extent. People want to buy a house where they can stream Netflix. Video games contribute. I think people spend more money on video games in the United States than we do in all the professional sports leagues combined. So I wouldn't trivialize it. You were not trivializing it, but I want to make sure that others wouldn't trivialize that. These things actually are important for the larger economy, even though they are entertainment. Uh, Mitzi, please. Hi. Uh, Mitzi Kohara from Montgomery County, Maryland, adjacent to D.C. Uh, I wanted to point out, one, Mayor Burke, that uh, or that the, the idea of having of literacy in the home being a barrier, you have actually something in common with the Big Island in Hawaii because what they found there is that they had many parents who did not want their children to get on the internet because they were concerned that it would drive them away from the island and it would take it in that. So my first question is, is anybody aware of any kinds of packets, toolkits, curriculum that is specifically designed to help people overcome their fears of technology 
we have this in Montgomery County. We had a, a an older adult, and we started doing training, and she had a Gmail account, and she went to set up another one, and a new one requires you to put in your cell phone, and she was concerned about giving that information to Google, and she was reluctant to stay and take the course. So th that's a real issue that we have. And the second is, um, uh, Superintendent Dance, nice to see you again. The, to the point of trying to figure out for our students how they are sufficiently accessing the internet in an environment that supports homework. Is anyone aware of a simple questionnaire that really doesn't require more than a fourth grade reading level that teachers can be giving to students that they can be discussing with parents as part of their parent-teacher conferences that helps us understand and target our efforts to find out where are those three to five or 15 kids in every class that don't have the right access so that we can take scarce resources okay. and prioritize. Great, so uh, resource ideas based on uh, Mitzi's questions? So we've been able to uh, use, and it's good to see our partners with Montgomery County, um, which in fact is the largest school system in the state. We're the third largest. Uh, so we do a lot of partnerships with Montgomery County. Um, we've been able to use the Speak Up survey, but we've also been able to use our own internal survey that we give every single year. Um, and we get roughly about 85,000 responses to our survey. Um, and so we've been able to ask families over and over every single year, do you have broadband access at home, and be able to define that um, for them. In addition, we've been able to give students assignments to take home to determine whether they actually have have that or not to be able to correlate the data with what the family says versus what the reality is um, on the ground. Um, we are facing though, um, you know, I've not had many families who say um, what's the value of this. Um, even our families who um, culturally may come to us and may not understand what we're, we're looking to do. They're not saying what the value is, but we're having a big conversation around data privacy. Uh, though, and a lot of families have asked us, you know, what, what are you actually sharing with your service providers on my child, which is a very legitimate question where we've actually had to formulate a data sharing agreement, um, which we can share with any um, school system around what does it take if you are partnering with us, the types of data we share with you that's not personally identifiable to our kids. And that's given our families a lot of comfort. And again, going back to BCPS1, and I'll end with this, where we sort of curate all of our resources, content into a, one single site on for us. We tell our folks we prefer you use that because that's curriculum and content that's already been vetted and that we actually have loaded student information in there to where teachers don't have to do it themselves, but that information, in fact, is protected. Um, so we actually share that with families so they get some comfort in terms of what's being shared and what's not. Any other resources related to Mitzi's uh, question? I don't have resources, but I, I did want to comment on the idea that uh, the ability to access uh, for health care, we're talking about healthcare as a sector costing close to 20% of our GDP in the United States. Five, uh, $1 out of every five goes to healthcare. How much of that then can be reduced by simply having the ubiquitous, redundant, robust, reliable, broadband capabilities so that the internet can be expressed in its most helpful ways? And I think generationally, we're seeing a difference between millennials being able to adopt this, and we're seeing healthcare being much more consumer driven, and we'll con continue to see that uh, tr uh, trend. And I think it's really like a hockey stick. Uh, sorry for that cliche, but I do believe that that uh, hockey stick is going to continue to climb upward as far as more and more consumers are adopting this. Uh, yes, generationally, I think there is some reticence about sharing patient records over the internet, and there's questions about privacy, but I don't believe that the millennial generation, for the most part, if I can generalize, feel those same concerns. They feel like, so what? Uh, that kind of information is going to be made public anyway. If it's not made through uh, social media, it's going to be made public somewhere else. So that, that to me is not a barrier. The uptake and the understanding of how to use it is a barrier, and I think that we can learn from schools and libraries on how to uh, socialize that information and normalize it for folks to adopt to use in their homes for health care. So there, there are some great curricula out there for um help people understand how they can use the internet and to overcome their fears. Uh, our association with the great Deb Sosha actually began before uh, Next Century Cities when we stole her um, Tech Goes Home ideas and, and took them through the Enterprise Center and Ken Hayes who's here. Uh, and now that is a robust program that's going in 30 different sites in our city to help people um, understand basic ideas of what they can do with uh, computers. But 
they still have to want to do it. They still have to want to show up for eight weeks and and do all that, which is hard to get people to do, even with a fifty dollar Chromebook uh, as an incentive at the end. Uh, but for those who want to, there's there's curricula out there and lots of different nonprofits who do it. Can we get a microphone over here? Um, you raise your hand. Um, while you're heading over there, Mayor Kirkham, I'm just curious. We haven't talked much about um, public safety and local government functions. Your network was built with those in, in mind at the origina uh, originally. Can you tell us just a little bit about how having fiber and having it controlled by the city in this case has led you to innovate in those areas? Sure. I think the most interesting thing is the ability to establish these portals, particularly with public safety and with education, that are in independent of an internet provider. And they're more secure, they're more efficient. So we've seen a lot of uh, really great things with that. Of course, we've often, I mean, often I talk about our, our live shooter exercise that's utilizing technology through fiber. It's a, a, it, the, you hear a gunshot in the school and within seconds it's the, identified in the, in the police car. They can identify the shooter exactly where they are in the school. Um, that's something we partnered with the Department of Justice for. We won a $75,000 grant for that. We just recently, uh, through public safety initiatives, received a $600,000 grant through the um, National Science Foundation, which I know, you know, when we were talking about just having $4 billion to invest wasn't enough, I'll tell you $600,000 at our level is a game changer. So we've been able to do a lot of really interesting things, particularly with public safety as a result of our fiber. Great. And we have a question. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much. We um, represent a large master plan community in Loudoun County called Brambleton. We are fortunate to have internet access, um, fiber optics directly to every home. We, though, are looking for always the next big wow. So do you have any comments, the future, as to content or, you know, what do you see on the horizons, especially um, like Chattanooga, what are you all doing there um, that you could share with us? This is a, a different digital divide. It is the, the wealthy, um, you know, rural folks that, um, that I know some of them not far from here have a, a challenge with. What is, the, what is the next big thing that I wonder? I mean, you've already gone to 10 gig, uh, Mayor Burke. I'm curious what some of the other folks, what are you looking forward to? Because one of the things I found, communities that climb this hill, they find that there's other peaks and, and things in the future. So what are you looking forward to? Um, you think we're going to tell you? Um... <laughs> The, the, uh, the, no, he, he, here's the thing is that no, number one is I really am looking forward to more communities um, getting access to, to broadband because what, the way that we think about this is this is not something that we want to have exclusively. If the, the things that we're doing in Chattanooga are going to get to that next level, we would need every community to have access to high-speed broadband because then if we're a little bit ahead of everybody else, then we actually have products to sell people. So we, we want uh, expansion to occur. I, I would just say that certainly at 10 gig, the medical applications – uh, kind of change. That's that's a place where we really can see huge amounts of difference. Um, and I, I also just think the history of the web is that you need a constantly expanding pipe uh, because video is on its way. We, we've had in Chattanooga uh, people coming in from Los Angeles uh, to take a look at our network and to see what kind of video applications for those who are in the content business, what you can do with that kind of, of broadband access. And so I, I do think when you start talking about entertainment and, and video, um, you know, I, I still don't understand why when I'm, I'm watching a, um, a, you know, a game and the Cavs are playing, why I can't click on Kobe's jersey and buy it while I'm sitting there watching it. You know, I, I, that, that's got to be coming, and that that's, requires a whole lot of, of broadband. Um, and, uh, and again, the medical applications, which I'm sure you could speak to a lot, a lot more. And sorry, please, I just want to make sure we have time to get to a couple more questions, so please go ahead. Well, I would just say that because our model, the way it's structured, I think the thing that we're most excited about is it allows the user to actually become the provider, and we just don't know what that means. I mean, we just don't know where that's going to go, and that's really exciting. And to be clear, what you're talking about is, is anyone that has a connection can offer services to their neighbors or other people and do lots of innovative things that will be complicated for most of us, but some people will make them easy for us. Um, we have a question here from Sean, and then we'll come over here next. Aloha, I'm Sean McLaughlin, Eureka, California. And um, I, I'm curious about, um, I mean, in our, in our community, we have a 10 gig circuit to the state university, and then we have parts of our county with, with no DSL, I mean, just dial up. So, um, but 
I, I'm just fascinated visiting here, especially when you look at federal policy and state policy and local policy. Um, how do you see the role of community anchor institutions? I mean, we look at, I mean, the first, like in our community, the first place that has it is the university or the school or maybe, if we're lucky, the library. But in the whole dynamics of it, it feels like at every layer of policy, community anchor institutions have a real important role to play in that, in that transition in a community, both digital literacy, inclusion, mm -hmm. all those other aspects. So I'm just curious if across a jurisdictional, you know, federal, state, local, how do you see community anchors playing a role here? Sure. I think uh, community anchors could actually mobilize the citizen consumer-driven uh, aspect of this. And if community anchors through organizations such as Shelby and others uh, can get together on that, see where they can leverage as far as funding mechanisms uh, are available, but also to drive that consumer culture to make sure that that literacy is there, to make sure that the, the, the known gaps are there and that there are solutions. And those uh, conversations are driven by community anchor institutions. And so I'd like to see more interplay among us. I would like to comment on one quick thing. Uh, as far as the burden on uh, community and municipal services, uh, in, when I was working in Virginia, uh, one of the most used uh, aspects of it was the ambulatory services for emergency because people would go into diabetic coma. Well, all of that kind of is preventive if you can use internet services to remind people to take their medications, to remind people to do those things, to take their AC1s and all of those kinds of things. But that was the biggest burden on the ambulatory services in Virginia when I was there was uh, di uh, transporting people with diabetic coma. Just a very sliver of an example of what could happen. Also in Virginia when I was working there, Loudoun County wanted all of their utilities underground and uh, we, we pushed that back to Loudoun County to make that decision on their own. I, I agree that the community anchor institutions all need to work together, um, you know, both on a particularly a, um, a city and um, state level. Um, but I, I will just want I do want to make this one comment though working you know in Kansas City and we have a very close relationship with the city and we're continually you know pushing to try to get you know a line item in the city budget for digital inclusion initiatives and we're working towards that but I will say that organizations like Shelby and NDIA the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and NTIA and Next Century Cities they are and anyone in this room who's helping to bridge the digital divide or advocate for organizations like libraries and anchor institutions your work is so valuable to us because we're not only trying to advocate in our cities and partner with people and putting together um, programs and services for our patrons and clients that we don't always have time to do the work here in Washington DC that needs to be done so I just really want you to know how much we value the work that you do and we really really hope you'll continue to advocate and I would just say that if you ever need success stories or statistics or information from a library or from a city or, or people like us doing the work on the ground we're always always happy to provide you with those things so don't ever hesitate to reach out especially to me or to anyone here on, on this panel i'm sure would be willing to help so we have a couple of questions we have two minutes so i'm going to ask you to ask your question very briefly i'll ask you to ask your question very briefly and then we'll do a quick lightning round and i'm sorry monica we run out of time Hi, Laura Breeden with National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about data and what kinds of data we have and what kinds of data we could use. And so I would ask any of you who want to speak to this, do you have all the data you need to make decisions? And if you don't, what do you need and who should pay for getting it? Um, That's a wonderful question. And now we'll, could, this question, and then we'll have people answer both of them at the same time. If you could be very brief, please. Yeah, sure. My name's Tommy Hubbard. I'm from Montgomery County. I wanted to return quickly to the public safety um, question. So in Montgomery County, we run a lot of traffic operations and public safety communications on our institutional network. And I was wondering for the mayors, um, how you guys have handled the security concerns with those important communications with all the other traffic that's running on your networks. Great, so we have uh, a question about data, and if you want to jump into this uh, second question first, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to answer uh, Laura's question. I, I think we need more geographic information system uh, data. We need to be able to map out where uh, opportunities are, where uh, people live, where they work, all and of those. Who sh sorry, who should collect it and who should pay for it? Who the, should the hard collect parts? it? Uh, 
preferably, I, I would like that to be a national initiative, uh, but it, obviously it needs to go up through the states and the, the municipalities have to provide that data. I mean, th there are various efforts, certainly for, for broadband, uh, but we don't necessarily believe that data. Okay. So it needs to be verified and it needs to come from uh, neutral sources. All right, sorry. Um, uh, Mayor Kirkham, do you wanna speak? And then we'll, last couple of comments. Well, in our particular situation, we, we partner with the county and actually provide the service. So we have a dedicated fiber line strictly for public safety. So there isn't any other traffic on the line. In schools, I say we have too much data. Um, but the reality is you want quick checkpoints around your formative assessments to make sure kids are on track for learning. The summative data at that point doesn't make any, any sense. It's an autopsy at that point. Uh, any other comments? Mayor Burke, Kerry? All right, well, this has been wonderful. Please join me in thanking our panel. And we have a second panel that will be coming up right now as I speak. I thought you had four, I think you have four they panelists. Took the other oh, they did. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good morning. All right, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're running a little bit behind schedule, so we want to make sure that the audience has an opportunity to ask all the questions that they want. Um, first of all, great job to the previous panel. That was really, really informative. So that, that, that was great. My name is Clarissa Ramon, and I'm very excited to be here. I am a community impact manager for Google Fiber based in San Antonio. And so before we get into the discussion, I'll do a quick introduction, um, and then we can jump right in. So at the end, we have Susan Crawford, co-director of the Berkman Center, professor of law at Harvard University Law School, um, author. I'm a big fan. Oh. Uh, we, have a, we also have Blair Levin, who is a senior fellow at Brookings. We have Gigi Sohn, who is special counsel to the chairman at the Federal Communications Commission, and Mark Erickson, who is the economic development director in Winthrop, Minnesota. So um, I think there's been a lot of consistent themes throughout the presentations today. And before we get into specific questions, um, I kind of want to step back and allude to, jump into something that Larry Strickling talked about. Um, where have we come in the past eight years? 
what has the progress that's been made since 2008, um, and where are the opportunities to improve as we approach this new administration? So I'm going to start with Susan and then work our way down. I'd just love to hear a brief kind of synopsis from, from everyone. Well, first of all, it's a great honor to be here with Blair Levin and Gigi Sohn and Mark Erickson, who are real leaders, um, and thanks to them. I'm, I just write about them. Uh, I think that it has been uh, a good eight years in terms of just getting this issue on the radar screen. We have so far to go. So part of my job is I don't have any clients or any consulting relationships, but I go to other countries. And every time I go to Seoul or I go to Stockholm or I go to Oslo, they are just abashed, just almost speechless about how bad the situation here is in America. That it's like coming to a third world country. And we can't imagine that as Americans. So we need leadership, we need vision, pushing for fiber as deep as it can go in America for all the healthcare applications involving eye contact and real connection with people, only possible over fiber, and advanced wireless networks for all the ways of educating our young, saving energy costs, rescuing the climate, all of that is only possible with an infrastructure build from the next administration that incorporates uh, bridges and roads and tunnels and everything with fiber that's open access. So that's what I'm dreaming of, and that's where we need to go. Blair. Uh, uh, that's <laughs> no, because I know the other questions you want to ask, and I, I, I hesitate to answer that question. Uh, well, let me just do it this way. So we did this national broadband plan. There were about uh, 200 recommendations. Some were, some were much more important than others. I would say sitting here seven years after we delivered it, um, we got about 50% of where I thought we should get. And uh, I have given a number of speeches, a number of comments on that. Some things I think we've made great progress, some places we haven't made great progress. But you know, look, but that's always true of almost any uh, kind of uh, long-term fundamental infrastructure. You know, Bill Gates once famously said people tend to exaggerate the amount of progress we're going to make in technology in two years and underestimate that on a 10-year basis. Um, I think our vision is a little bit awkward. For, so I, I, I kind of look at this and say, you know, Susan made an important point when she and I were working in transition eight years ago, broadband really wasn't a thing. Mm -hmm. It's now definitely a thing. Um, but whether it's a real thing or not in terms of policy, that is actually the interesting question, and whether we're at a turning point or at a continuation point is really, I think, the most important question right now. So first I want to say hi uh, and thank all of you in this room, not just on this panel. Uh, over the last three years, I've been with many of you at many different events, uh, and it's been great. You guys are the heart and soul of getting broadband out to all Americans. This is going to be my last uh, public appearance as an FCC official. It's been fabulous. I love it. I've loved it. Not every minute, but most minutes. Uh, you know, I, I revere... I, I, re I revere my boss, Tom Wheeler. It's funny, I had a lunch yesterday. This is not answering your question, but it's a great story. A lunch yesterday with a reporter at a very important publication who kept asking me, you know, why has Wheeler done this? Is he favoring certain industry? And I keep saying to him, I kept saying to him, no, he actually believes that the consumer, the American people are his clients. He said that from the first day and he'll say it the day he walks out. And if anybody questions his motivation, trust me, he doesn't like any of the companies. I'm, I'm just kidding, but anyway. <laughs> uh, tweet that. But he, you know, do not tweet that. <laughs> But his, his, his client is the American people. It has been since the day he walked in the building, and it will be the, the day he walks out of the building. That's really all he cares about. And that's why he's done what he's done and stuck by his principles. So, you know, reporters out there, start, stop trying to find a reason other than the one that's in front of your face. Okay, that's what he came here to do. It shocked people. You know, even people in the public interest community in which I used to reside were skeptical that he was going to serve the American public, and that's what he's done. And I've been very, very proud to work beside him. So there you have it. There's my speech. So what's, where were we eight years ago? Eight years ago, people were still arguing that broadband wasn't essential to full participation in American society. And they could say that without people, like, screaming and yelling at them, okay? 
now that has changed. And obviously, the debate over an open internet net neutrality when four million people filed comments with the FCC really put a fine point on that. And it was great to see Senator Bozeman get up there and essentially say, you know, it's an essential input. All Americans must have it. It is not a luxury. It is a necessity. We can argue whether it's a utility or not. I don't think that's important, okay? What's important is that everybody has to have it, whether you are rural or urban or poor or rich. And that's what we work to do, and I'll talk about that more as you ask the other questions. So the fact that we've gotten over that hump I think is huge. And now we have to talk about, okay, now that we recognize that everybody has to have it, how do we get it to them? Mm -hmm. How do we get it to them at the right speed and the right price? And that's, what the, that's the conundrum that we haven't answered yet. Well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, in most respects, I'm the least qualified person on this stage. Oh. I am a direct result of the knowledge that I have gained from all of you over the last eight or nine years. And our small cities and our 10 cities, our RS Fiber project in Minnesota started about the time of the Obama administration. And what I have seen during that time in a, attending uh, d uh, dozens of uh, conferences and listening to all of you is that the education process has, has, is w well underway because that's what happened in our small, very conservative communities is once people were educated to the opportunity and they understood what the opportunity costs were, what they might be missing, they uh, said, we want to put our taxes on the table to make this happen. And as I wrote a few weeks ago, this is in the middle of Donald Trump company, or, uh, country. Our uh, county went three to one uh, for him, and uh, they all see this as, an, as, an, as a non-political thing that just needs to happen in their lives to improve their lives. And I think that the process in the last eight years has been one of education and a, a, awareness, and it has opened the gates. Awesome. Thank you all. Um, that actually leads us very beautifully into our next question. So I'm going to direct this towards Gigi and Mark. And I love that you're on this panel because we have so many folks who've traveled from outside the Beltway to learn from each other. And so um, to get to what can policymakers do at the federal level to help these boots on the ground, the scrappy organizations, the municipalities? Um, as somebody who works at the local level, we often hack solutions together. Um, where is the common ground here? In these extremely partisan times, where is the common ground? So I'll kick it off with Gigi, and then I'd love to also hear your response as well, Mark. I, I don't want to really talk about what the federal government can do because I, I do think, and you know, I gave a speech in Minnesota uh, a month and a half ago in Minneapolis, and I said, look, the battlefield is now the localities and the states, and the battle plan has got to be every chamber of commerce, every school, every library, every university, every citizen, every chamber of commerce, every business coming together to figure out their broadband future. And if their state prohibits them or puts barriers in front of them to, uh, you know, to that broadband future, then they need to organize. You know, there's a, <laughs> and after I gave that speech, somebody got up on the stage right after and said, we need to file petitions at the FCC. And I was like, did you just hear what I said? Okay? <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether it's a Democratic or a Republican administration. Local governors, bipartisan, no, excuse me, local mayors, we saw that, bipartisan, and now, you know, bipartisan members of Congress recognize that it's going to be the community's role, and the federal government can only do so much. You know, we can improve our competition policy. That's what lowers prices. We can continue, you know, Chairman Wheeler modernized E-rate, which is the, the schools and libraries funding program, he modernized Lifeline, which is the subsidy to lower-income Americans, and we put out a lot of money for the Connect America Fund, and we also um, modernized uh, funding for rate-of-return carriers, which are the carriers in the smallest rural areas. So we've done our part, and obviously the FCC will continue to do its part, and I was delighted, and I tweeted what Sandra Bozeman said about the FCC being um, playing a major role in the future and continuing to have the funding so that it can play a major role in the future in providing broadband. So we'll continue to do that. 
but it's really up to the local communities and is harder, it's more expensive, there's no doubt. It's a lot easier to file petitions at the FCC and get one-stop shopping. Obviously, the Sixth Circuit didn't like that idea. So now it's up to you guys to make it happen and to learn from the examples of Chattanooga and, and Winchester, Virginia. Excuse not Winchester, Virginia, Westminster, Virginia. Maryland, right, Maryland. right, God. I went to Virginia for Turkey Day, so that's why it's on my mind, right? And Holly Springs, North Carolina, and Champaign-Urbana. We can keep naming them. Share your success stories. Look at what's happening in Colorado, where local communities are saying, you know, damn that state law, we're gonna build. Now, not all the state restrictive laws allow you to do that. But if local communities come together and go to their state legislatures and say, we need this, because young people are leaving our communities or leaving our states because there's no broadband, and big companies, and you know, Ellen Katz is gonna go like this because GE went and fled Connecticut and went to Massachusetts. I gotta believe that's partly because they don't have great broadband there. So make the economic case, make the case that growth in a state is not going to continue or is going to stop unless you have this public resource. Great answer. Uh, when you say the a federal government, um, that means a lot to me. I mean, it's it's so bureaucracy hit uh, uh, laden. Uh, but from a from a fifty thousand foot level, I I think the uh, federal government needs to uh, continue stressing the importance of this. Uh, but I don't think you look to them for your answers always. I think we look to the federal government uh, too much for answers when the when we can do our own solutions in our own uh, com communities. The one uh, suggestion I have for the federal government regarding fiber to the home, and I think that is the end game, I think fiber to the home is the end game, is to uh, help with financing, not provide the financing. I think if the federal government would just provide some loan guarantees so that our local banks could look at that and say, well, you've taken the risk out of this because it's new to them as well not necessarily spend the federal dollars, guarantee some loan opportunities from some local banks, uh, take the risk out of it. That's what we hear. That was our number one obstacle, was not creating awareness and not creating enthusiasm for it. We had 56% of the people in our 1,000 square mile footprint say they wanted this, and, that, and it was actually higher than that. We had a hard time attracting the financing because they would say, oh, you're a startup. Oh, that, there's a lot of risk in that. Well, if you would take the risk out of that, I think you would really open up some opportunities. Um, so I think they, you, you can't push down from the federal government. You can't push down from the top. I think this needs to grow up from the bottom. And I think uh, Susan, uh, uh, several years ago, hit the nail on the head when they, she said that the bully pulpit that the mayors have is the most important tool that we have in this tool chest to uh, create the enthusiasm and the momentum for fiber to the home networks. Great. I know you didn't ask me, but I'm going to give next. a couple of answers. <laughs> and since everyone's been agreeing with uh, with everybody, I'm actually going to disagree with almost everything Mark just said, who's really a great guy, and it's not personal. Number one, the reason I like working with mayors is it's not about the bully pulpit, it's about actually doing things. Other people do the bully pulpit. Mayors are like plumbers. They actually have to get something from A to B. Plumbers get water from A to B or sewer from A to B. Mayors get data from A to B. And I think that's why, I mean, I certainly, since I left the plan, I've been working with mayors because they're just very much more productive about getting getting there. So um, th th that's number one. Number two, I actually don't think it's about financing. And number three, I actually don't think fiber to the home is the ultimate solution. I think there are new developments in wireless that are important. But, you know, we can chat about that. But to go to the specific question, there are two great networks that now need to be built. One is the 5G network, and the second is the what I think of as the civic Internet of Things, a subset of the Internet of Things, but from a government perspective, it's adding intelligence to the fundamental infrastructure that we have. There are certain things that the federal government can do to facilitate those things. Um, I am primarily interested in what I, I agree with the essence that it's really a local issue, and I would note sometime later today the governor of Rhode Island will announce an RFI related to trying to get that state to do a kind of comprehensive look at all the next generation networks, but particularly 5G to be, make Rhode Island the first 5G ready state. 
I would urge you all to read the RFI, and if you see a resemblance between that and certain things in the National Broadband Plan, the coincidence is, it's totally a coincidence. But the, uh, the, um, but, but the larger point is, there are still some things that can be done at the federal government level. One of them is poll attachments. Uh, basically, it's about getting rid of barriers to deployment. One is poll attachments. There are various uh, things related to that. The second is MDU access. Uh, Susan has written about this. Others have written about this. But it's just very clear. And, and by the way, the economics change the politics. In a 5G world where you have multiple parties needing access to certain kinds of fiber that they're going to have to share and to having certain rules related to small cells and things like that, I think the politics that we've we had pretty clear politics for the last eight years that will not at all be relevant to the world I'm describing. Um, and then um, uh, the, 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 and then finally, I just think the, the federal government, here's where I think the bully pulpit is really important. I think we should welcome anybody who wants to do this and the notion of shutting off cities or shutting off nonprofits or shutting off people and just having the incumbents do this. I'm not opposed to the incumbents doing it, by the way. I've worked on a lot of projects that have involved incumbents. But as anyone who's ever negotiated a deal knows, if you only have one option, you're not going to get a very good deal. And the more options you have, the better deal you get. And so why Republicans want to cut off, why people who pride themselves on being able to strike the art of the deal want to limit one's leverage in negotiating a deal is a complete mystery to me. So I think there are a lot of things that the federal government can do as we look to the networks that need to be built for the future. Yeah, I just want to chime in you, yeah, and yeah. you can support this because uh, the ability of cities to not only provide uh, genuine high-capacity internet access for communities, uh, for businesses and homes, but also manage the water we use, manage our energy use, manage all the Internet of Things applications that are going to be used for civic purposes, have a multi-purpose network that serves all of those functions, will lower the operating costs of that city tremendously and make it much more effective. So every 5G hotspot is going to need fiber coming to it in order to handle the tsunami of data that we're going to be generating through all this. So what everybody needs is a fiber network with open interconnection points every 50 feet or so that will allow for competing 5G providers. So Blair and I are in singing a hymn here about the power of cities uh, to get this done, it, but it has to be done in the right way. And I'm hoping that we'll see infrastructure as a holistic, one network serves all function, lowering the cost of operation for many of the important policies we need to carry out in order to survive as a country and close the digital divide. Of course, can I just make one point? Some of the policy prescriptions that Blair talked about, access to apartment buildings or MDUs, multiple dwelling units, poll attachment reform, can be done, not in all cases, at the local level and the state level. Okay, you know, I, don't, I learned a lot about poll attachments. They, they did my first Pretty education. Pretty sexy stuff. Oh my God, it's so boring, but it's so important. <laughs> uh, you know, I was actually told, <laughs> I'm glad I'm leaving the government because now I can actually speak my mind, but um, <laughs> I was told. You tweet that as well. I was told in the, in the Minneapolis speech I was not allowed to say that poll attachment policy was boring because I would upset somebody in the FCC. So it's very, it's very. But just to be clear, the person who would upset is Tom Wheeler, who prided himself <laughs> on getting it's the poll attachment. It's very complicated. Act of it's complicated, but it's seriously important. But again, some of these things can actually be done uh, at the local and state level. So we don't need. I'm not saying the federal government should sit and do nothing. And I do think the bully pulpit is important. But a lot of times people just look to the federal government for one-stop shopping when it could actually be done at a more local level. Great. So um, we've, Donald Trump has alluded to an infrastructure package, proposal, plan, investment. Um, I'll start off with Blair. What are some specific recommendations that you would like to see included in such a proposal? Um, so I'll say three. N number one, communications networks should be included in the entities. I, I, I am actually skeptical that they've said it on the website, but I'm skeptical that it will actually occur. But, it, but it, maybe it will, and that would be great. And I think it should be broad in terms of what those networks are. Um, number two, um, all entities should be eligible to receive the funding. Uh, I have some concerns about the way they're setting it up. but. 
you know, the fundamental idea of using repatriated funds as kind of a layer of capital to leverage a lot of other things. Actually, Reed Hunt and I wrote a book in 2012 which suggested the same thing. Um, so I'm not, the, the fundamental structure, I'm actually okay with the financing. The third thing that I'd like to recommend, recommend has nothing to do with broadband policy, but I actually think it's the more, most important one, which is there ought to be a no pay to play provision. Um, this part of my resume is actually no one ever remembers this. It turns out to be the most important part. I used to be a municipal bond lawyer. Um, Reed and I agreed that we should call me a communications lawyer because it made it sound better when I became chief of staff, but the truth was I was a bond lawyer. But I, so I was in the bond business, and uh, the bond business, um, a lot of states adopted, thank God, a no pay to play provision. Because otherwise, look, look, you can read the Old Testament, and it's just clear people have bad instincts. Uh, you don't need to read the Old Testament to see that, but you can see that we, have, we all have a dark side. And if you create a situation where um, if a mayor wants to give an investment bank a contract to sell a bond, the mayor comes back and asks for campaign contributions, that's a bad situation. And I very much worry that if you have a trillion dollars going out there, um, you can create a bad situation. So if you add a no pay to play, it makes every, and everything is done on the merits. And by the way, Trump criticized the Clinton Foundation for its pay to play thing. I'm not sure the facts justify that. But the principle of no pay to play ought to be one that Republicans accept. And I think that's a very important piece to add to that legislation. Just narrowly on the bonding point, uh, one problem with municipal bonding is that it will then set up a tax deduction that you can only take advantage of if you actually need that tax deduction. Obama administration did this Buy America Bonds program. It was extremely successful. And having some element of the infrastructure bank uh, support uh, bonds that would be available to other sovereigns and lots of private entities uh, in other parts of the world who might be very interested in investing in our basic networks would be extraordinarily interesting. So I, lowering the cost of capital, uh, having local infrastructure banks uh, deal with their local conditions, as Mark is suggesting, would be extremely important. And having and conditioning access to funding on interconnection obligations and open access, very sensible planning that any real estate developer would want to see in an infrastructure plan. I'd like to see all of these more long-term thoughts built into the infrastructure plan for the Trump administration. Mark, did you have anything to add? No, uh, I think those guys know what they're talking about. Uh, we just need to, <laughs> I'm telling you, uh, we need to find a way to make this happen. And, and, and I will go back a question and I will uh, redress a, a Blair here. Uh, where I live, 5G is not a solution. Out in the rural parts of this country, uh, well, 5G is a, a 10 years out. So, I mean, if we're going to wait for 5G, we're going to have to sit and wait for 10 years. And he already turned his mic on. Because uh, <laughs> I, I, I understand. But, but, we, but all wireless goes to fiber. And if we don't have that robust backbone and, we, and out there, wireless just doesn't work. It, 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 it's a wonderful complement to the fiber. It's an, it's an amazing, important complement to the fiber, but it's not the integral solution that we need in our communities. And that's just my opinion. You, you, you might be right. I, I, I don't actually have a firm point of view of that. I'm constantly, I'm an empiricist. I change on the basis of various things. Elon Musk, a very smart guy, is spending a lot of money on satellites. I remember when Reed and I were at the FCC, there were a lot of other smart guys. Bill Gates, Craig McCall spent a lot of money on satellites. So that failed. Maybe Elon Musk does, maybe it doesn't. 5G doesn't work in rural because you don't have the density and the, the propagation characteristics. I completely agree with that. But that doesn't mean that other forms of fixed wireless, which are being developed, uh, might, might not work. So I, I you look, I've, I spent an awful lot of time trying to drive fiber deployments in various cities. But at the end of the day, we have to, we, we have to learn anew every day and things change. We have to. But it, what is certainly true is fiber investment always pays off over a long enough period of time. Yeah. When you put fiber in, you're, gonna get, you're going to get a benefit from it over a long period of time. Yeah. So I'd like to tease that out a little bit because I think there's many communities here who feel like they can't wait, that maybe they've been waiting long enough. So what, is, what does that perfect or a good solution between fiber and wireless networks look like? In a perfect world, um, you mentioned that 5G m maybe is not compatible for the best communities, perhaps 
some communities do not have the opportunity to have investment in a fiber network. Um, what are some of these other creative solutions? Is there anything that we necessarily haven't touched on um, that would be a good solution from folks in the room that do represent um, underserved communities or rural communities? And this is open to, to anyone. Where I come from, the, the providers uh, own it all. I mean, we are the newcomers. We are the people that they don't like to see. They don't like to see the communities rise up and, and, and uh, 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 take action. So uh, we, we live in a world where uh, we only respond to what the providers give us. For example, John Deere, uh, every piece of equipment that they manufacture has a 3G modem in it, not a 4G modem, has a 3G modem in it, and they run and rely exclusively on the AT&T network. That's great. In Sibley County, we have a terrible AT&T network. There's, there's no towers out there. So um, we are, have been dependent upon what the providers allow us to do and they provide for us. But what we did is the 10 communities and the 17 townships said, we, we, we ask you to do this for us. They said, no, we'll, we'll pay for it. We'll put the money up and you can own the network. We, we, uh, we don't want to do it. No, they didn't want to do that either. So these very conservative towns said, well, then we're going to do it ourselves. And we have, and it's changed everything. So it's different in the rural areas. It's different in Colorado, Jeff. And you know, it just, it just is in the big cities. It's a, it's a much different game. Uh, uh, but we're provider dependent out there. And we need to we need to change that equation. I just think you're gonna have to throw a lot of spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. But I do think having local choice is critical out there. I mean, you're starting to see some of the big carriers decline Connect America fund money, right? I mean, it's not pervasive, but in our last auction, several big providers, including Verizon, said no, thank you. So, okay, thank you, Debbie. Only Verizon. Uh, I don't think that's true, but in any event. Um, uh, so the fact of the matter is, is look, it's not economic for the big providers to serve these areas. And, you know, taking government money comes obviously with responsibilities and obligations that some of these folks don't want. So if the community can't serve itself, they're going to find themselves royally screwed. So I think local choice needs to be available to everybody, whether you live in a big city or a small rural community, but particularly for the rural communities, I think it's critical. Um, so without doing a commercial announcement, Kevin, um, with the community handbook is the second edition is coming out Monday. Monday. Okay. So Benton is publishing a community handbook that myself and someone else wrote, uh, Denise Lynn, uh, basically talking about a number of different models, but there's a lot of models we didn't talk about. Um, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, and some others that have a lot, I, I completely agree with the point of local choice and plan beats no plan. Um, but uh, there are a variety of different ways of doing it, and what South Portland did was kind of interesting. What Lincoln, Nebraska, like, which is fundamentally about conduits, is kind of interesting. I, I think we should talk about the elephant in the room, which was a lot of the stuff that's was that's in, actually in the handbook was was driven by either Google Fiber or fear of Google Fiber. And incumbents often responded to the fear of Google Fiber in, I think, a very productive way. I think their fear of Google Fiber, uh, this by the way is not a, by nature of a question to the people who are hosting us today, uh, Stacy. Uh, but, the, uh, the, uh, but the point is, if Google provides a competitive force and maybe they're gonna do it in wireless, m maybe not, I don't know, but then the dynamics change. So we have to respond to that, but I, I, don't, I don't discount the role of incumbents in being more responsive if, if other options become available. Susan, anything to add there? No, I, I'm, uh, the thing to think about is, is going to be fiber. I just don't want to have us lose that. It's going to be fiber as deep as possible plus advanced wireless everywhere. And that way we close three gaping digital divides. One, nationally, we are at risk of not being the sandbox for new occupations. Because we don't just need new jobs, we need new occupations for people who are going to be displaced and are, have already been displaced by automation and will be further displaced. We need that. We have a 
gaping digital divide between urban and rural, and we have a gaping digital divide between rich and poor. The only way we're going to close that is to have the standard of fiber as deep as possible plus wireless across the country. And whatever it takes to get there, vision, leadership, you, all of you are showing that, and access to capital. Yes. I might add one thing. Uh, we have become so risk averse in this country, especially when it comes to government funds, that uh, we are just afraid to do anything. You know, when we built the the rural electric right. network back in the 30s, what a huge risk that was. Yeah. I mean, goodness gracious, that had never been done. And and fiber has proven itself to be a future-proof network. Uh, it's, it has proven itself to have many benefits. So if we could become less risk-averse and invest in it because it needs to be done, and if we could also recognize that uh, well, fiber is the first goal, but it's what you do with that fiber in your community. It's how you put it to use is where you're really going to get your benefit, and that's where organizations like U.S. Ignite uh, come along. You know, uh, when we talk to groups, uh, when I talk to groups, I say, how many of you were in band? And a few raised their hand. I said, well, when the uh, conductor goes horns up and everybody uh, puts their horns up, you have the fiber. When the baton comes down, that's the music you make with that fiber. What you do with health care, what you do with education, what you do in those areas, that's where the real benefit from these networks. But first we have to have the fiber, and that's the conundrum, yes. Great. So I think we can uh, open this up to some audience questions. I feel like there's a few people who are itching maybe to, <laughs> to, to ask one. So, um, yes. Uh, aloha. Sean McLaughlin, uh, Access aloha. Humboldt in Eureka, California. Um, I just wanted to back up and think about, um, we're talking about, I mean, we sort of found out what media tribalism looks like, uh, it feels to me. And when we talk about broadband and communications, especially in community level, it's the media aspect. And I, for me, uh, anyway, I think about how people communicate, the decline of the quality of information, and all of that relates. And the infrastructure that we're talking about here is communications infrastructure. So we think about those sort of fundamental policies of competition, diversity and localism. I wonder in this new administration, do you think there, and you've talked about this in terms of what community, and it's sort of devolving to communities to do this work, or it always was the communities, I guess. But is there, is there any traction, potential traction in localism, sort of the media localism thread, the importance of people having a voice and how this infrastructure serves that? Do you think this new administration is gonna have any kind of uh, open ear to the idea of media localism? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so let this me, let me be a, clear this about this. This is, actually, this is actually a really big thing, but for a somewhat side point reason. So, I, I, my title is Brookings, but I actually support my Brookings habit by working on telling Wall Street investors what's going to happen. And as you have to be kind of like, um, kind of clear-eyed about it. Here is the single biggest. There are there are three pieces of legislation that are going to affect infrastructure. There's an infrastructure bill, a tax bill, which is maybe the most important, and a telecom bill, uh, all of which will do various things. But the second most important thing from an investor perspective is about we're about to hit a tsunami of big bang consolidation. Um, there have been a number of things which have, from a Wall Street perspective, artificially suppressed the mergers. Uh, probably the single biggest thing is fear of GG, but I will. <laughs> but uh, so let's put that. Anyway, so the fear of the Obama administration, you don't do it during a change in administration. The incentive auction has prohibited people from talking to each other. And the third is media ownership. All of those things are going to change, roughly speaking, over the next nine months. So those are constraints which will not be in place. The number of pieces I read on Wall Street, the number of conversations I have with people on Wall Street, about what, which deals will be allowed is just phenomenal. Yesterday, somebody wrote a piece, a very good analyst, a guy I've known a long time, talking about the great synergies of a Verizon Comcast deal. Yeah. So let's not kid ourselves. That's what Wall Street is thinking about. Now, I'm not going to opine on whether these things are good or bad. I actually have complicated views on that, but, but I try to keep my Zen-like indifference to it when I talk to Wall Street and just say whether it happens or not. Susan can say whether it's a good thing or not, and I think I actually disagree with her on a few of them, but. But here's my point. On the media side, despite what Trump said about the AT&T Time Warner deal, there is very likely to be increased broadcaster consolidation on that. Now, 
some of the consolidation, in 1995, I was in favor of getting rid of the newspaper broadcast cross ownership rule because I think that suppressed resources for news. And I think that rule, which was put in place by Richard Nixon to punish the news media, uh, actually was a, was, a, was a bad rule. But there are other rules where I think you're going to have problems. But I don't, do I, do I hear any signs that people think that's, uh, you know, m my impression of my friends at the American Enterprise Institute is they think the internet is going to produce a lot of those things by the nature, we're simply gonna change the platform. But, but watch for the wave of mergers because that's gonna affect, affect infrastructure spending a lot too. So here's where the uh, idea of community choice comes in. A local community could decide that some sliver of the revenue coming from the operator of a, the, the many independent competing retail operators of ISP services in that uh, area fed by wholesale fiber, let's say, that is either operated or at least overseen by that local community, that some sliver should go to the support of local news through local journalism schools, through storefront operations that you know, help kids learn how to report. That, a community could make that choice. I agree with Blair, we're not gonna see any national support of that kind of move, but a community can choose it. Mark, did you wanna add anything? Uh, um, if I read what Blair says, and I might, I might disagree with him twice here, and that would just be un <laughs> unprecedented, and I don't think you're saying this. If what comes out of this next administration is there's lots of big mergers, and that's good for Wall Street, I'm sure, that, that's, to me, that's the opposite that needs to happen. Yeah, 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 but that's the opposite needs to happen. We, we need things to happen at the granular level. We need these small towns, Gibbon and Fairfax and Sleepy Eye and these little towns out there to have no hope in anyone's lifetime of having any fiber to the home built in their communities. We need somebody to say, here's, here's a way that you can build and finance and you have to do it properly. It's a business that you just can't do it. It needs to happen in the capillaries in this country. It needs to happen away from the heart and away from the arteries. It needs to happen out on the meat and the bone that we make that stronger out there. And, and, and I don't I think that's what you were saying. I wasn't talking about what I want to happen. I'm just describing what will happen. Yeah, I understand. So, so before, but if, but if, before we get into the economics of mergers, <laughs> uh, when I, we have a, a few people who are waiting to ask questions. So. We can take that offline. Sure. Yes, I'm sir. Mark Johnson with MCNC in North Carolina. So to take us back to infrastructure a little bit, you've talked about the potential for advanced wireless 5G uh, taking the place or, or supplementing fiber to the home, uh, but all the mobile operators have business models based on scarcity, not abundance, and have techniques in place to discourage people from using that service. So how do you deal with that issue? And create models where you are actually encouraged to use the network and not discouraged from that use? Well, one model I, I talked about is, is requiring a neutral interconnection point that could be used by any 5G operator and not allowing one of them to lock up the pole or the street light. And then you will have competition and they will all be interested in making sure there's abundance. So actually, I think they are driving towards lots of wireless use using 5G. They want to see lots of bits. They just want to be that sure that they're the only provider pr for a particular area. And that's where local choice about control over infrastructure becomes extremely important. Yeah, I, find, I find some of these new zero rating plans kind of interesting because they're zero rating the highest bandwidth applications, right, video. So what does that kind of tell you? It kind of tells you you don't really need those caps. And I've heard Roger Entner, who works a lot with the telecoms, saying, Caps are a thing of the future, okay? And this is not to say we just, you know, competition is what's gonna get us the greatest abundance. So let's, let's be frank, okay? But I do find it interesting, the, the current business models where you're taking out of the data caps the thing that supposedly constrain your bandwidth. And I, and I wonder, and I certainly hope, that that means a future of greater abundance and not more scarcity. Yes, ma'am. Ellen Katz, Consumer Council from Connecticut. And Gigi, for the record, um, GE said they left Connecticut because of high taxes, which is why they moved to the low-cost metropolis of Boston. <laughs> 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 um, but if there's one takeaway for me from the election, and I look at the swaths of red in the rural areas, it's that rural America feels ignored, I think, by government. And I think that's a bipartisan problem. But when I'm, um, you know, playing to my 
listening to my darker side, as, as Blair said, um, and I've met many of these small town mayors, and it's the, the mayor is also the CI, CIO because he knows how to run the projector. And I, I mean that with respect, they are truly the plumbers, but I just don't know how to offer them hope. I just, I think I agree with Mark. Until we see like a rural electrification parallel on the federal level, I just don't know how we can get that done. But, if, but again, how do I give them hope? What can I, how do I work with these folks is my question. Talk that to Mark Erickson. I mean, he, look what he's done in Minnesota. The RS fiber is truly inspirational. What we have done, in, not, not me, what a lot of us have done. Um, uh, I don't know how you give them hope. I, what we did is, is we stood up in front of people and, and gave them the facts and said, here's, here's what the future is going to look like. You're going to need more bandwidth unless you think the Internet's going away, and, and you're going to need fiber, and, and a, a 15, a 15 a 20 megs isn't enough. And by the way, no one talks about the symmetrical nature of fiber right. enough. Right. We need to talk about how we had low latency enables all kinds of interactions and all kinds of applications that will benefit our lives. Um, I'm going to go off topic for just a second, and I'm going to get in so much trouble. Uh, fifth, uh, Fifteen years ago, we tried to have five communities build a fiber home network, and we were too early. But we hired some folks from Telcordia Technology, which was Belcor Labs. And these consultants came in, and they are very, very smart. And, uh, and I said, how come we don't have more bandwidth in our, in our networks? And he said, and I assume it's true, I've always believed it to be true, he said that there is more fiber in this nation, that was 15 years ago, if the providers wanted to, if they had a last mile solution, which they were working on, they could uh, turn the bandwidth the spigots on and flood the entire nation with more bandwidth than they could possibly use. But, he said, they recognize the way that OPEC <laughs> handles their oil supply, and they're going to trickle it on in just the right manner so they can maintain their revenue streams, and they, they don't want the supply to, out, to outstrip the demand. And, and I think that's essentially true. And, and uh, uh, so data caps, from my understanding, are, are nothing but a small printing press in which you make money. You just impose a data cap, and you get an extra nickel or dollar or three dollars a month from somebody and you multiply that by a 15 million and, and it's a lot of money. So I think we need to recognize the, the symmetrical nature of fiber and the fact that unlimited bandwidth is unlimited bandwidth. It, it, they're not, they're, they're just, there shouldn't be any cap. And wireless is an issue with that though. I, I, I understand that. <laughs> can, can I just offer a contrarian point of view because I just feel like that's No way, job. no way. Shocker. A brief, a brief contrary point of view. So, on Valentine's Day, February 11th, I mean February 2011, I, I had the joy of debating some of the executives of the rural phone companies. Just before the debate, um, Pete Sessions, a congressman from Texas, got up and said, we need deregulation, 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 too many regulations. We should deregulate everything. We should particularly deregulate your uh, industry. And 3,000 rural telephone guys got up and said, and, and gave him a standing ovation, causing me to stand up and say, I've I was a little surprised you all did that since if we de deregulate uh, your industry, the number of you sitting in next year's convention will be zero. We, we spend a huge amount of money on rural, okay? So that, there is a political problem. I, I absolutely agree with that. And there's a translation problem, and I don't mean to be snarky, but it, there's a lot of get your government's hands off my Medicare problem in rural America. When you look at which states are what we might refer to as the taker states. They're all largely rural. Um, uh, we, the federal government is largely biased to, in terms of where dollars flow to rural. I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that. I'm just saying that's a fundamentally political problem. It is not, it's, it's, but it is not a fair representation. And I mean this, this is really important that people understand this. The Lifeline program is going to be under threat. Okay, I believe deeply in the Lifeline program. I'm still incredibly pissed that in the first Obama term, the chair chose not to reform the program the way he should have, but rather joined with the Republicans and just getting people off the rolls because we didn't have an opportunity to make the changes which Tom and Gigi made in a way that would then show how much better it would be. And unfortunately, we're in a situation where I think those changes could be reversed and I feel 
that's a horrible thing. But in terms of the dollar spent to get people on, it's much more efficient than, than what we do in the high cost areas. So I don't think we should, like, ign we, may, we may have lost an election, but truth I think still matters. And I think we're spending an awful lot of money in rural. We may not be spending, I'm not sure we're spending it as wisely as we should, but we shouldn't buy into this myth that somehow we have ignored that part of the world when it comes to broadband. So all the rural folks can tackle Blair after this panel, but we're gonna move on to <laughs> we're gonna move on to this gentleman has been waiting very patiently. That's yes, okay. sir. Uh, Jeffrey Gablinski, I work for EX Squared Technologies as well as run uh, or co-chair Mountain Connect, which is a broadband conference in Colorado. And my, I guess, suppose my question is: is um, does it make sense to reform CAF? Um, to your point, Blair. I think one of the things I've witnessed, at least in Colorado, is that CAF clouds progress in some ways, in that the incumbent companies promise to do things. And if you look at the rules around CAF, too, um, it's built to an outdated model. So it's built to a 10-1 model. So if you go past or beyond the, the funding um, period, the markets are already said that that standard is already behind. And so, and I, I suppose the other point I wanted to make was, or ask about was, does it make sense to do less? So instead of having an incumbent company like CenturyLink take the entire state of Colorado and spread uh, very little progress over the entire state, focus on the high cost areas and actually reduce that so you could actually build to, even if you wanted to put a number to it, the, the FCC standard uh, broadband definition. Okay, can, I, can I just say, if people thought, if Gigi thought pole attachments were boring, wait till we get into the details of CAF. <laughs> so like, look, uh, that complicated, is, not boring. It's a complicated thing. Here, here would be my big picture response to that. Uh, we are fundamentally uh, funding a CapEx we're trying to solve a CapEx problem with OpEx. And I, would, I, I hope the infrastructure fund does this, basically offers to give certain carriers a check decided on a reverse auction. You build the network and you never come back and ask for anything else again. And not, not to cut off the other option, but to just exchange it that way. I would, I'd be totally in favor of that. There are lots of different ways of doing it, but if you look at the money that's been spent since the 96 Act in rural America, it should have built that network out, is my point. Did you, ha did you finish your question? There was there more yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. I just, I just think that at the end of the day, that's one of the things the federal government could do to, to help, especially as Mark was talking about in rural communities. Um, that tends to cause a delay in action yeah. and, and in planning in some ways. And I think if we could re refocus that effort, it might help our rural communities move forward faster. Okay, thank you. Did anybody else want to touch on that? We have one back here and then up here. Okay, I think we have time for a couple more questions and then we can go up to some final comments. Hello. Um, hi, uh, Mitzi Herrera from Montgomery County. Blair, I wanted to come back to your issue about that 5G doesn't work in rural areas. And the flip side of that is that the investments that local governments make to create densely populated cities, both with the roads, the schools, the library, et cetera, is a valuable investment to telecom companies that want to cost effectively reach subscribers. So can you talk about how we can build more support for the idea that local communities need to be able to charge reasonable fees to telecom companies that come in and use valuable public property so that we have funding to support those digital literacy programs and those other adoption programs and the other ones that help low-income people. Because at the end of the day, it takes money to drive this, and if local governments are part of the solution, they have to have the funding and not have to rely on the federal government to put those things in their place. And one way to do it is to leverage people who are benefiting from our infrastructure investments. So I'm going to agree in part and disagree in part. The part I agree with is the local government should have the, should have the choice. But here's where I disagree. In an era of a monopoly telephone company and a monopoly cable company, it was very easy to impose fees on those things, and local governments did that and paid for a lot of good things. I'm not arguing about that, but it's kind of a, it's like a, it's a, it's a tax that people don't notice. Um, I think in a world of uh, both competition and where there is essential 
infrastructure that actually creates the bigger tax base. Uh, cities are wiser not to look at those that, that infrastructure as a cash cow, but rather to look at it as something which enhances the economics of everything, right? So what you see in real estate, like fiber, uh, when a fiber hits a home, it adds $5,000 to the property tax. I'd rather cities get it there than by imposing fees. But that is a choice that I think, the, I mean, and I've had this argument with lots of different mayors and stuff. It, requ it actually requires work. You actually have to figure it out. But I would rather see cities, and this is a lot of what I think Google Fiber did very effectively, what we tried to do with gig.u, was to try to say there is a different way of looking at this about where you get it. I'm not opposed to you guys having the right to impose it. But if I were on the council, I would almost always oppose imposing it because that actually depresses the investment you need to drive greater economic growth. Susan, I, I, just want to, to I just want to push back just slightly <laughs> because what we're seeing in competition is they're not coming and each one of them is overbuilding the entire community. You're getting three and four people going to the same wire areas and you're getting nobody but the incumbent that we required because we had build out requirements serve those other areas. So the, the way to, to spread that out and also I would say this, for our businesses, they need more than one fiber provider to that building. And at and I don't want to just point them out, but the, uh, the incumbent that leveraged its power as the way that it gets into that building and it doesn't have to share the conduit with those competitors, those policies we haven't corrected. So we don't promote competition, which is better for business. We don't have the ability to require that service and competition reaches everywhere. So the ability to collect, not a cash cow, but reasonable fees that are equitable enables us to help flatten out those inequities. So well, first of all, well, as to the question we have, of- We have only a few minutes, and so I'm gonna, if you'd like to respond to that and then also give like a final recommendation or comment on this, and we can start with Susan, because you've been itching to answer, to answer these questions. Well, just to, just to respond to this very sensible intervention here, that this is the same question occurring at many, many levels. Government needs to act like government. We're not a peer with companies. We're actually government. And uh, where there is basic infrastructure, like a middle mile network, like anything else that's in place, like a pole, like a conduit, it needs to be made available to competitors. You can charge something, but it can't be unreasonable. And you can require build out and require maybe that people in, have, who have less means pay less for what they get. I mean, it's just very sensible and happens at every single level. Where middle mile networks have tried to be cash cows for states, it turns out nobody wants to build the last mile. So, you know, so charge something, but not too much. Did you have any final thoughts or recommended, like one big takeaway recommendation for the first 100 days? Nobody has a crystal ball, but if you want to throw something. Well, I think this is a moment for the happy warriors of telecom policy to really get out there and organize and uh, to be part of a bigger infrastructure set of thoughts for the Trump administration and not to just carp, but try to get in there and work on basic infrastructure that feeds all of our policy needs and is available on a non-discriminatory basis. Thank you. I would just say you can't make America great without great broadband. Uh, that is a really cheap shot, but, but I'm not above making cheap shots. No, look, I, the, 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 the fundamental point that I think is important is, the, is in the same way that a nation needs a national broadband plan, local governments need it because so much of what they do, you know, there are three fundamental problems. How do we get affordable, abundant bandwidth everywhere? How do we get everybody on? And how do we use it better to deliver public goods and services like healthcare, education, and public safety? Those are the challenges. Those were the challenges in 2008. They remain the challenges. But the local governments are going to do more uh, to do that, and the federal government ought to be the partner as opposed to someone who actually discourages local governments from doing it. So my recommendation is bipartisan, no matter who the president might be, uh, is that listen to the American people, listen to what they've been saying over the past eight years, that they need this for jobs, for education, for civic participation, for communication, for entertainment. They need it, they want it at a good price and at fast speeds. They don't like media consolidation, that is across the board. People don't like it. I don't think the American people are hankering for complete and total deregulation of this sector or frankly any sector. So listen 
to the people who elected you and the people who didn't elect you and see what they believe in this space. And I think you'll find a great deal of unanimity. Inside the Beltway, you know, there are a handful of think tanks who think they should get rid of the FCC and get and re all regulation is bad or nearly all regulation is bad. I don't think that's shared by the American people. I don't think they want to see huge multimedia corporations run amok. And I did a lot of canvassing in York, Pennsylvania, which is 50% Republican, 40% Democratic, and 10% independent. And I talked to them about these issues. They don't want to see one broadcast network or one cable company or one telephone company. They want competition. They want choice. They want empowerment. So that would be my advice, is listen to the folks that brung you and the ones that didn't bring you before you make policy in this area. I agree with that, but I would add that it's, and I, I would concur and say that it's, that it's really all about local leadership. It's not about government in the rural areas. And, and the distinction is here in Washington, here on the East Coast, in the big cities, it's government. You always talk about your local leaders, that's government. Out there, it's not seen as government, they're local leaders. Four of the ten towns that are in our RS Fiber Project can't find people to run as mayor and can't find people to run on the council. They don't think that that's government. Those are just local leaders who agree to take the time to uh, try and fix things and they look to them for answers. So we get a lot of pushback in Minnesota because I say the word municipal network, municipal uh, government networks and they don't like that. And really it's really about local leadership. It's local people saying this is what we need in our lives to make it better and we need our local leaders to go out and make that happen and that's what they've done. Uh, I'll say it again, in, in our uh, uh, county went three to one for Trump and 10 cities and 17 townships in that same county, real close, they all went three to one, put their taxes on the line. Did that say that they're anti-government? No, it says it's local leadership has said this is important. These aren't anti phone company and anti-cable company projects. They're not. These are pro-local community projects. We need to make our lives better. We need health care. I want my grandma to stay in her home longer, and that's important to my state budget. I, I'm, <laughs> thank you, Google, for the leadership that you took in, in 2011 that really uh, emphasized the, the need for fiber. Thank you all so much for being here. Before we wrap up, I just want to make one final plug and action item for those of you who live in municipalities and cities outside of D.C. and even in D.C. Um, one of the partnerships that Google Fiber has with NCC is the, are the Digital Inclusion Leadership Awards. This is the second year that we are hosting this. There is an application. I encourage everyone here to apply. We want to learn about the work that you're doing. We want to share those best practices, and we want to celebrate that. So this is the second annual phase of these awards. If you have any questions about how to apply, um, please talk to myself or Deb after after this panel. So thank you so much. Can to I the just panelists. do a plug uh, a plug sure. on top of your plug? So as part of our Lifeline order, the FCC <laughs> is going to be issuing its digital inclusion plan at the end of December. If you've not talked to, if this is something where you've got expertise and you want to share best practices or talk about how the FCC can help facilitate, again, I still believe it's largely going to be at the community level, but we are sort of, you know, we want to be a portal for people to get information about how to get people online. If you have expertise to share and you've not shared it with our staff, let me know. Clarissa, anybody here knows how to find me, and it's not that hard. Um, see my Twitter handle, use it often. Uh, well, it'll last for another month. Uh, but we'd love to have your input if you've not given us input. Wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody, and thank you for everyone for being here. So folks, please stay in the area. We really do have a quick turnaround. Our senators are both in the building and they're going to come and sit in just a moment.
Folks, no. You got me? Okay. Folks, if you could please have a seat. Um, our two senators have a very tight timeline, and so we'd like to ask you to all please have a seat. Thanks, David. Uh, I think you're there. You meant stage left. Oh, that's right. Okay, folks, if you could have a seat, please. We'd really appreciate your assistance. Deb, you're going to introduce the two of us. To we are two actually. One more person. Um, yep, somebody from Minnesota. Okay, so. All right. Okay, folks, we're going to get moving. Deb, thank you for allowing me to introduce uh, Senator Klobuchar. As our senator, as my senator, and the one who I always vote for, uh, <laughs> she's a, a person that gets it done and is willing to reach across the aisle to ensure we get the support we need to solve problems at the local level. She understands, she understands the struggle in rural communities and is championing the need to ensure we get fiber to every farm in Sibley County and every home. It is my pleasure to introduce Senator Amy Klobuchar. And I have the honor of introducing Senator King. I first met Senator King quite a few years ago when he was the governor of Maine, and I was the principal of one of the first one-to-one -one laptop schools in the country, and it was in Massachusetts, and I was visiting your schools in Maine. Uh, always a person to seek the innovative path and always an advocate for pragmatic bipartisan solutions, Senator King is also a founder of the Senate Broadband Caucus, along with Senator Klobuchar. Um, the Senator's dedication to ensuring that all have the necessary hardware, training, and broadband access has been an inspiration to me and to many others. And joining the Senators as moderator today is Special Assistant to the President, David Edelman, a brilliant young man and a wonderful advocate for ubiquitous broadband. We thank you for your support, David, and thank you for joining us here today. Thank you so much, Deb, and, and thank you, Mark, for the kind words. I would like to begin by commending Next Century Cities, not just putting, for putting together another great <laughs> event here on broadband, uh, but also for stacking it so full of Minnesotans, which really, <laughs> as someone from the Twin Cities, I really appreciate. Sorry, but we do what we can. So we are lucky here today to have two of the Senate's leading voices on broadband issues, founding members, as was mentioned, of the Senate's Broadband Caucus, Senators King and Klobuchar. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we dive in, let me just set the stage with a little bit of context and specifically some t statistics. Let me start out with 98%. 98% is the percentage of Americans covered by 4G LTE wireless. That number was 0% back in 2009. 300% is the average speed increase of the average home broadband speed in the last <laughs> six years. And we have seen dozens of new municipal and other innovative broadband projects in cities around the country, cities that might have been left behind. So that's the good news, but clearly, as I think we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about today, there is a lot of work to be done. We've begun some of it as a country, and both of your states have been real leaders here. 30% was the number of US K-12 schools that had access to high-speed broadband and wireless in 2013. Today, thanks to programs that were championed in part by two of the centers on this stage, that number is 78% of school districts have that high-speed access. So we've closed the digital divide in American schools by half, but there is a tremendous amount of work left to be done. Just in schools, the work to get to that last 99 or 100% by 2018, as the president challenged us to do, to ensure that students can get online at home to do their homework, and especially for the poor, because one of the most sobering statistics that we can look at is that if you're in the bottom 20% of income quintiles in this country, then your chance that you have broadband at home is under half. If you're in the bottom 20%, under half, 49% chance that you have broadband at home. And yet, if you're in the top 20% of this country, that chance is 95%. And that's even worse, as we're going to talk about today, when you adjust for the rural versus urban divide. 
So we have a tremendous amount of work not just to do, but a tremendous amount to learn from states that have been leaders in this space, states like Minnesota and Maine. And so we're hoping today to get a chance to learn from some of those successes and to look ahead to the next four years and beyond of what sort of progress that we can build with leadership like we have in the Senate. So Senator King, if I might start with you, there are a lot of priorities in the U.S. Senate. You're dealing with tons of issues every day. Broadband is one that now has its own caucus, but is an issue that doesn't necessarily leap to mind for everyone in the country when they think about solving some of the hard social challenges that we think about not just at election time, but all the time. So tell us, when you're making the case back home for the good that broadband is doing and why this issue is important, how do you make that case? And what are the areas that you're most excited about making progress because of broadband growth? People that don't have it know they are lacking something important. And I think it's part of the rural-urban divide. I brought a couple of maps. Can I share them with you? Of course. Um, that's the nice thing about being a senator. I knew what he was going to say. <laughs> uh, OK. I didn't. <laughs> this, this is, this is a, a map that shows, essentially, the distribution of broadband. And uh, although the next map I'm going to show you is different colors, but Anyway, bear with me. Yellow is, um, these are communities with, at, with, with broadband access generally. As you can see, the Northwest, California, a few places down in New Mexico, Arizona, along the East Coast, concentrated over here, okay? That's the, this is the map of broadband and no broadband, okay? This is the map of the election two weeks ago. Do you see any similarities? The, gr the blue in this election is Hillary Clinton, the red is Donald Trump. And what you see is the rural-urban divide. And part, uh, I'm convinced, part of the reason that this map looks like this is the widespread and not irrational perception of people that live in these areas that they're being left behind, that they're not included in the national economy, and that they're being... Uh, they're, they're missing something, and one of the things they're missing is broadband. And one of the great challenges, it seems to me, in our country, not necessarily politically, but just uh, from, a, from an equity point of view, is to be sure that people that live in all of these communities have access to this basic piece of infrastructure for competition, business, and just plain living uh, in the 21st century. So I just thought it was fun. This came to me at 11 o'clock last night, the Senate printing office did a great job this morning to produce these. <laughs> but don't you think that's an interesting correlation? The, the lack of broadband and all of this red, I think there is a, a consistency there, not because people who didn't have broadband, you know, voted for Trump, but because people that live in these areas feel left behind and broadband is a, big, is a real important reason, I think. I'll leave this one up here. It makes me feel <laughs> That's more inspired. So, I was going to suggest that. Senator Klobuchar, walk yeah. us through how you're thinking about this issue. Okay. And we are obviously at a time of agenda setting. Yeah. And what is the agenda that you see for the Senate and more broadly for the country mm -hmm. in addressing some of the issues that Senator King brought up? Well, thank you very much. Uh, and I want to thank Angus. I, I um, so enjoy Angus as a colleague, so much so that my family uh, visited his family on vacation <laughs> that shows like you know, and I've, one of my favorite Angus stories too involving that was he knows his state so well which is why he's gotten involved in this issue that as we were uh, on the way there I called him and I said uh, we're gonna be like half an hour late there's this bridge it's, and he goes I know what bridge you're on <laughs> blah 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 and he, then he tells me the whole municipal story from the past of when he was governor then we get there we're staying at his place and there's cartoons on the wall and one uh, was when when he was governor and from the main paper and it said <laughs> Angus King's ar organizational chart and all it is is a square in the middle that says Angus King. <laughs> Why have Ronnie things but I mean it's kind of the ultimate the buck stops here right um, and I know that I came to this issue very much uh, like Angus did uh, and that is that I know my state and in fact I visit all 87 counties every year. I do different things. I go to businesses. So you would have to be an idiot not to realize yourself when you're trying to call from the car that your phone doesn't work. OK, let's start with that. So there's cell phone issues. Uh, but then you also, of course, have internet issues when you're trying to download things or send an email and you're just blocked out um, at certain points. 
um, then talking to the people in the communities is where you really um, see on the front line what's happening. The stories of uh, farmers who literally go to the McDonald's in Wilmer, Minnesota to their parking lot um, and Mark and knows what I'm talking about here in his county, but, but they go to the McDonald's to do their business every morning. Not to buy a cup of coffee, but they go sit there and so that they can communicate with their customers. Or the uh, tribal members who told me of the kid whose parents got Wi-Fi and all they looked outside and all these other kids from the reservation were doing their homework in the front yard. Those are sad stories. Um, and so... Um, what I think we need to do is to allow people that grow up in rural areas, who kids that grow up, to live in rural areas. We don't want everyone just in our urban centers. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough to have mid-sized cities like Duluth and Rochester, and uh, then you go down to like Albert Lee, we have Moorhead and Fargo. So we've been able to kind of spread out some of the metropolitan areas, uh, but we still have problems in extreme rural um, in Minnesota. Um, and so I look at it as an economic force uh, to keep business where the people are. Um, I look at it as a way to attract employees, especially younger employees, uh, to these towns that actually have very functioning businesses. We have um, companies up in northern Minnesota like uh, DigiKey, Articat that makes ATVs and um, uh, snowmobiles, um, and they often have hundreds of openings at their companies. They put up billboards, they bus in employees from an hour away, um, and I want to keep those companies strong, and there's no way younger people are going to move there uh, if they don't have Wi-Fi. Public safety issue, you've got <laughs> snowmobilers, we've got a lot of snowmobilers that get lost. Um, the, the and, you know, the, they have to be able to communicate. What? It, what well, it, I was going to say, you and I are, the, the short answer to your question is, this is a really high priority. Yeah. This is a really, it, and for me, it's rising as I think about the importance. Is this right. is this is rural electrification of the 21st? It century. is, and it is a way to um, not just reach people, but it's a way to keep the economic gains in this country strong. And people don't realize the rural poverty rate for kids is higher than the metro poverty rate for kids. So we there's a reason to want to have investment in our rural areas. So, Senators, tell us, obviously, your selection here was not by accident. Uh, that There has been real progress. Uh, while at a national level there has been some progress, it's been uneven, and certainly at state levels it's been uneven. What's been working? Where are the areas, what are the lessons that you've been seeing as you travel around all of Minnesota's counties, uh, all of Maine? There have been a lot of innovation. I was up in Maine with you, Senator King, talking about some of the major projects there that, again, have taken years, communities coming together. What can you tell us about that as we you know, begin to enter a period where this recognition is happening, this issue is sinking in? More and more folks know they have to do something about it but want to know what they can do about it. What are the lessons that we can see there, either Maine or Minnesota? Well, the last panel, the gentleman from Minnesota was talking about local leadership. And in my experience, that's the irreducible requirement. He was absolutely right. And in this audience somewhere is a woman named Susan Corbett from Washington County, Maine, who is, who is uh, Washington County is one of the most rural and low-income counties in America. And she has single-handedly well, with a great team, created all kinds of options for people. And the word create is really important because she's used creativity and different, different ways to do it, but to make, uh, uh, to make broadband accessible to people in this very rural area. So if, 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 if I was going to, if somebody was going to say, what works, I'd say Susan Corbett. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we had 20 of her in Maine, all of our problems would be over. But seriously, there, there, I think one of the keys to this is innovation. We can't, it, it's not one size fits all. It's got to be, uh, in, and we're, a, we're a state with all kinds of topography. It can't be all wireless. It can be some wired. But we've got to be creative. One of the things I love, uh, 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 Amy has a bill, dig, dig once. You know, if we're going to dig up and build roads, let's put a conduit in that everybody can use and just have it there. When we do, if there's a state-owned railroad line or other rights of way require the utilities to put in a, uh, you know, we got, we, all of our states are crisscrossed with rights of way. Uh, these huge, you know, 345 kV electric lines, let's put in, uh, you know, when, when they do it, let's put in a, a conduit. The incremental cost is very low of doing it at the, at the right time. 
Um, I think the public-private partnership idea, of course, is working in parts of our state, um, as Mark knows. Um, the federal government's role, what I see, what has worked, which was your question, um, it is areas where they got big grants out of the stimulus, um, out of uh, USDA programs, um, up finally in the northern part of our state on the Canadian border. Uh, we have been able to get internet so they can compete with resorts and lodges from Canada where they always did have Wi-Fi. Um, the, um, in addition to the working with our municipalities about laying the fiber, um, it's also getting more money out of the Universal Service Fund. And um, Senator Thune and I led a letter. We got 59 senators on that letter, which makes a difference because it shows we could do something legislatively with the magic number of 60, 59 plus us. Um, and um, we pushed the FCC um, to come up with some way to um, give out more money based on standalone broadband. Um, and um, that would be the people that didn't have the landlines and make sure that the small companies, phone companies could get reimbursed if they uh, put in broadband. And that's just the beginning now. We hope the order wasn't perfect, but we're really happy the FCC decided to get something out and we can build from there figuring out more ways we can access that universal service fund and getting that combination of grants um, and private money out there. And um, when we have a chance to talk about the new administration, because we're going to have a new we'll one, <laughs> uh, maybe we can talk about some other ideas going forward. But I think it's that key of the local leadership Angus talked about, the public-private partnerships, and then making sure that where we've had public money that it actually gets out there. I, I think the most, one of the most important things any, any and all of us can do in the next month or two is to, if whatever access we have to, have to the due administration, the, pre the president-elect is already talking about infrastructure. It's one of the things he talks about more frequently than anything else. He's talked about it in a bipartisan way. He's talked to Chuck Schumer about it, and there's a lot of general support for the idea broadband has to be part of that package. Um, and the idea that's out there that you've probably heard about is to finance infrastructure. There's a lot of talk about the money that's overseas, the trillions of dollars that's sitting over there, uh, the negative consequence it's had with our tax system where we have inversions and some of the things that have been going on. The idea would be to find a rate, and the White House has been working on this for quite a while and has some good ideas, uh, but find a rate where uh, you can get the money to come back if companies voluntarily bring it back. A certain percentage would go into either an infrastructure financing authority or straight into different um, funding authorities, highway fund, and we would like that to include broadband. Is broadband a bipartisan issue in the Senate? How can it be more of a bipartisan yeah. issue? It's one of the few bipartisan issues right now, and it's pretty strong, and that caucus is a good group. Yeah, one of our co-founders was Shelley Capito from West Virginia, and she's worked with me on some homework gap. You mentioned it, 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 you have wired schools, but then you go home and you don't have access. It's like power up and then power down when you need to do your homework, and that doesn't make sense. So uh, she's been uh, deeply involved. John Bozeman from uh, Arkansas, I think the Alaska senators. Uh, so there, there's definitely bipartisan Heidi Heitkamp. This, this is not a partisan issue. No, and right, the mobile now, the bill, of course, is right now we're still hoping we can get that done by the end of the year, and it's tied in with the issue of our wish to get uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel um, and to get her up again for her term, and so that's been uh, kind of a, now that's a more partisan debate, um, and we would really like to get that done and then get that bill done that uh, Senator Thune and others, and including myself, have worked on. So you mentioned mobile now. Certainly there are other areas where the new administration will inherit what is effectively an implementation effort. I'm thinking, for instance, of the new Lifeline broadband subsidy, where around 40 million Americans will, uh, over the course of the next several years, have the opportunity to get a subsidy for their broadband service and was previously available only for telephones. Um, so let's get to that question of advice moving forward. You know, the new administration, maybe, maybe they're listening, maybe they're not, but certainly from the standpoint of what's an agenda moving forward, what either areas do you want to see continued in the next administration or new areas that could be brought onto the agenda and advice that you would give them to look ahead to the next several years of this area? Well, I think since the president-elect has made infrastructure um, such a major priority was the first thing he mentioned on the night of the election. Uh, we have to really 
um, make that the focus. And I think overall for our uh, Democratic caucus as we look for areas of common ground, that should be a focus. I think that helps. As I look at the new administration, it's going to matter uh, who the USDA head is with the uh, uh, rural grants. Uh, we don't know who that person is yet. There's been someone nominated for commerce. Obviously, we're going to uh, reach out on that issue. Um, and then I think um, at the FCC, that's going to be important as well. So we're going to, I think the fact that we have a bipartisan group in the Senate working on it is going to be really important because we can go in a bipartisan manner to these new people in the administration and talk about. Um, uh, what we think they should do to move it forward. But continuing work on the FCC, given our limited ability so far to pass things and disagreements on some of this thing. Yet Senator Thune is from a rural state. He's a good leader. Um, and my hope is that we can move more in commerce. Senator King, what would you like to see out of the next four years and beyond? Well, I don't, it, it isn't really, I think it's not within the scope of what we're talking about today, but uh, I gotta tell you, I'm worried about net neutrality. Uh, and I'm worried about the rollback of the rule that has, was passed by the commission and approved by the court, uh, which I consider deregulation. Uh, rather than regulation, it's a, it's a structural rule, it's very simple, and if we don't have it, then we're gonna be regulated, but it's gonna be by giant corporations. And so that's an issue that I, I am concerned about over the next four years, and, and I, I think the good news about this incoming administration or about the president-elect is I don't think he's ideological. I don't think he comes in here with an ideological agenda. I think he's sort of pragmatic. And um, so I don't think people can really predict with any great certainty where he's going to land on a particular issue. Um, and again, it, it comes back to who's, uh, who's advising. Uh, but I think the assumption that he will carry the basic Republican agenda of the last 15 years is not necessarily a, a, a valid assumption. And we'll, you know, maybe I, I'm a congenital optimist, but maybe I'm wrong about that. But uh, I think there may be places where there will be areas of, of agreement. But uh, the next four years, I think getting broadband into these areas is crucial for the country. It really is. Otherwise, uh, we're dooming these areas to uh, economic stagnation and worse. Yeah, I've already had small businesses that tell me, you know, we just couldn't take that contract on because we can't go to McDonald's all the time for that. There, are, One thing I did mention, there's some companies in Minnesota like Genio, Turkey, when we had the avian flu, all that, they actually built out their own fiber to farms that are producing their turkeys so that they can measure the barn temperature and things like that. That is not a model that's gonna work for most of rural America, unless you got a turkey barn. Um, but um, it's just interesting to me, the pr it just shows, it's a good example, because it just shows the priority that's being put on broadband by companies and why there's so much interest in it. And it's renewed interest because for a while it was, oh hey, we need access so I can send an email to my kid in college, right? And now it's we can't get by without having high speed access, not just access. So you're both leading from the Senate. We certainly hope to see leadership moving forward from Washington, but a lot of folks in the audience here and presumably watching online are not necessarily spending their days here in DC. They're with community organizations, state organizations. What advice do you have to the rest of us out there that aren't in the Senate, that aren't in elected office, that aren't in government necessarily, that want to carry this issue forward? Do you have any charge to the rest of us who are all here to think about this issue moving forward, again, regardless of where we happen to live in any given day? Keep in touch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um... The political system ultimately reflects the public. Just as a parenthetical, one of the reasons the political system is so divided and gridlocked is that the public is divided and gridlocked. I mean, the, 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 the division, the partisan division in, in Congress reflects the partisan division in the country. Um, but to the extent people uh, are, are see this as important, I think this is an issue that transcends party. I really don't think there's a partisan interest here uh, but it's got to be viewed as a basic infrastructure issue. I mean, I go back to the 30s. The, we're facing a very similar situation where uh, President Roosevelt and others realized that not having electricity in rural areas was a, doomed them to, to a second-class citizenship. But the argument was we can't afford it because the houses are too far apart and the wires cost too much and it doesn't make sense. So they invented the co-ops, of which we still have a few in Maine. One is in Washington County that I mentioned. 
But we've got to we've got to have creative solutions to fill in those gaps, and government's got to be involved. It, it, it's got to be involved just like on roads and bridges. It, we've got to stop thinking about this as different from roads and bridges. And Yeah, I would just, but the old-fashioned calling, writing letters, of course, do that. Uh, but it's really inviting members of Congress to come to towns and areas and hear these concerns um, because I think one of the messages from this election, whoever won, whoever lost, was kind of a resurgence of a statement uh, by rural America uh, that they wanted to pay, get paid attention, uh, that they have some needs out there. Um, and so now you have one party that's running all three branches of the court, of not the courts, <laughs> but the, the House and the Senate and the presidency. And so there's going to be a lot of pressure to do something on them. And then you have the other party that didn't fare as well in rural areas, with some exceptions, like my three members of Congress. Um, but there's also going to be, they are going to be pushing this issue too uh, to want to deliver. So I just think we're at a really key political time um, to push these levers that we have in rural America to get things done. Well, thank you. I think what we've heard here is loud and clear in the 21st century. Connectivity is opportunity, as we say, and we could not be uh, more lucky than to have both of you continuing to lead the charge in the Senate. So please join me in thanking the two senators for their leadership. Thank you. In case you wondered, Angus is wearing a lobster tie. Yeah. That's what that is. That's These are not crawfish. Is, he's kind of These taking this local matters to heart. And there you are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. So I think that uh, you would probably, uh, my name is Glenn Reichert. I'm with US Ignite. But we've had a fantastic morning this morning. I think you would all agree. Would you help me thank all of our speakers from this morning? I think that there is a real charge that we have here today with change comes great opportunity. I think there's great opportunity in a bipartisan way to go and take forward advanced broadband and its applications and services to benefit all Americans. And I think it's incumbent on each one of us to make that happen. And I think I'm speaking for all three of the organizations that have organized the meet this uh, session today, uh, U.S. Ignite, the um, uh, Next Century Cities, and of course the Shelby Coalition. So thank you very much, all of those folks. Just a couple of housekeeping uh, um, things. We have three demonstrations that uh, U.S. Ignite has arranged here in the hallways. Uh, starting over here, you've seen virtual reality, but you haven't seen live virtual reality before. So go and take a look at that headset. You're going to be looking at another human being in 3D helping with solar education. A solar education demo in virtual reality, augmented reality. Uh, don't miss it. You've not seen anything like it before. In the center here, we've got a live feed from Madison, Wisconsin, where we're seeing the use of advanced wireless to be able to go and bring advanced car to infrastructure communications. That's demonstrated right over here. And then over on this side, we have the Emergency Operations Center from Lafayette, Louisiana. They have a business emergency operations center that they put into use recently. Talked to Michael Dunaway about what's been happening there. Some great demos. Lunch is directly behind us, and we encourage you all to stay and talk. Thank you very much for coming today.